you know what? It's, it's really sad. It, it reminds me of New York What is the old? What is the old D for? Right. What do you call they doing that K2? K2. And then they got the fat. What's the name? Little is the K2. Tell me. China. And they, they said they put it in wrap for it. You got a thing about it? Yeah. I already got it. That's all right, right? That's fine. I'm going to put one of these out just so you like Asian and put it back. Good? Yes, I'm going to So, so, so you don't hear You only hear this one. Yeah. 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 The man don't want to say the crime and do a lot of them. They don't have a And then that, and just kill me, whatever else you want me to do. It's no problem. No problem. No problem. I don't know what's happening in that party. People are so messed up. I hear that. Oh, dude was smoking that K2. He gets it thrown out. A Habarigani. Dude, who's Alright, one more time, family. Habarigani. Alright, one more time so that everybody up and down. MLK, Good Hope, the whole Ward 8, the whole DC DMV can hear us. Habarigani. Good All right, family, I want to thank y'all so much for coming out here tonight. Y'all could have been anywhere else in the world with us for Kwanzaa, for Kuji Chagalia, but y'all decided to be here, and you guys are in for a treat tonight, you know, because right here before us, we have a man, uh, um, Baba A. Peter Bailey, who just came back from Ghana. He has a whole lot to tell us to report on what happened on the ground in the last eight days that he was there, and we're going to tie it into a very powerful concept that was laid before us a couple generations ago, and it's pretty indicative of the direction that we have to go in as black African people. And that concept tonight is Pan-African Federalism. Please say it with me, family. Pan-African Federalism. All right? So I know you guys are asking, all right? Kwanzaa, Kuchi Chagalia, Pan-African Federalism, Ghana, what's happening here? How are they all connected? It's a very simple answer to that. All I'm asking is that you guys you know, enjoy tonight, um, enjoy the festivities, and take in all this information. And as you're listening tonight, take it upon yourself to think of some very powerful questions, all right? Because we're here to talk. We have until 9, until 9 p.m. tonight. So I'm just asking if y'all can just bring it, you know, bring all you can, but at the very same time, listen. And also be on the lookout for what we have going on in 2019 as far as organizing in the D.C. area. Because what we have to do as black African people is be organized. We're mobilized right now. We've been doing a whole lot of mobilizing. Everybody has um, a network that they got. They have a business. They might have an initiative. They might have projects that they're doing. And a lot of us are doing the same things. But are we coordinated? Are we organized? That's the question that we got to ask ourselves. And if we're not satisfied with the answer, the next question I got for y'all is, how are we going to get there to be organized? All right? Yeah. Can All I right. get an I'll shade of that? I'll shade. All right. Beautiful. Beautiful. So we're going to get started. And before we move on to the next portion, just want to remind y'all what we're here for. We got um, the Facebook Live going on right now, which is going to get uh, reposted by We Act Radio. So for those of y'all who are on Facebook watching right now, shouts out to y'all. Hey, hey. uh, once again, we're here for the Kwanzaa Kuchi Chagalia celebration. And to open up this celebration, we're going to have none other than Baba Sangor pretty much to um, light the Kwanzaa candle and get us in, you know, set right. Bring the ancestors in and do what we got to do pretty much to get in the space because we're all here for the season, right? Yeah. Uh, beautiful, y'all. Right. You ready? All right. So, uh, you know, first I just want to warm it up a little bit because, you know, in the spirit of what we're going to talk about tonight, we're, we're, we're actually are our ancestors. And for those who do not know what I mean when I say we are our ancestors, just remember this word, blacktricity. Uh, throughout the Kwanzaa presentation, I'm going to explain to you uh, why uh, this, this term came through me. It's not mine. It's not about me or she. It's about we collectivity for true sovereignty in the 21st century. We need blacktricity. Uh, blacktricity is a science term that I picked up on after studying Garveyism for so long and practicing Garveyism and actually serving as a president general. So I really take that serious because I believe 
that we need to come up with our own science par excellence. Blacktricity is much deeper than electricity. Blacktricity is produced through love. You don't need a plug. You don't need any of that. It comes from the most high as above, so below. So everything on the planet has to have blacktricity to live. But uh, I see my brother Cliff coming in here from BMO. Hey, brother Tubman City in the house. So, but, but it's really important for us to recognize that we have to de-emphasize individuality. I'm going to say that again. Kwanzaa, for me, de-emphasizes individuality. For me, Kwanzaa is a time that we're supposed to reflect upon collective work and responsibility, uh, cooperative economics, Kuja Chakalia self-determination, unity, near purpose, and of course, creativity and faith. Y'all got it? Yeah, okay. So it's our time not only to celebrate, it's our time to reflect upon what we've done in the past year and before that, and what we have not done, and what needs to happen so that when we go in, and we just experienced one of the most powerful solstices yeah. of all time, and I don't have time to give into the science of that, but if you understand that no man created that, that was all created by universal order, yeah. That's right. and there is order in the universe, and we right now on planet mud are out of order. Mm -hmm. So we have to accept that responsibility. We can't just say it's the other fellow. I was taught by Garvey Ice and Walk with Garvey <coughs> that it's about us. We put too much time talking about the other fellow. The other fellow is at war with us and trying to exterminate us and trying to stop us from moving forward and getting back. Now, everybody talks about the 400 years coming up, 2019. All that's fine and dandy, but we go back way, 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 way back, way before the transatlantic slave trade. So anyway, without any further ado, drummers, but I just wanted to say that because our ancestors are very much present. And we're going to do libation, and you're going to do it with us because we know libation is a spiritual way of connecting us to that blacktricity that I'm talking about. And we have to be connected. I don't care whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, whether you practice Judaism, whether you are Yoruba, whether you're Archon, whether you're Kematician, whether you're Vudun, or whatever, a Buddhist, or whatever you are, it's one spiritual power that we have to recognize. Everybody with that? You can even be atheist, but science by excellence, some kind of way you got here, right? Okay, so without any further ado, we want to call on the right excellent honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey to have his drink. We want to call on Amy Jocks Garvey to have her drink. Amy Ashwood to have her drink. I'm going to call some names you may not have never heard of, but it's very important for us to know that all of those who went before us uh, created our path of where we are today. Drusilla Dungy. Natty of the Maroons. Uh, Sabuque. Thomas Sankara. Kwame Nkrumah. Harriet Tubman. Sojourner Truth. Come on, y'all. Patrice Lumumba. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Come on, call them all, because it's more yeah. than us. I mean, Paul Cabral. That's right. That's a great one. Come on, call them, y'all. Yes, come on. Fanny Lou Hamer. Come on. Call them out. Don't wait. Just call them out. Come on. Malcolm X. Come on. Carter G. Woodson. Duke Ellington. Come on, y'all. Khalid uh, Muhammad. Khalid Muhammad. Khalid Muhammad. Khalid Muhammad. Bobby Wright. Bobby Wright. Oh, Francis Christ Wilson. Francis Chris Wilson. Medgar Evers. Medgar Evers. Worthy Muhammad. Yes. Yes. Come on. Call them all. Come on. Don't be ashamed. Hassanatu. Hassanatu. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Sekou Toure. Sekou Toure. Kwame Ture. Chancellor Williams. Okay. Chancellor Williams. Oh my okay. goodness. Julius Neary. Dr. Clark. Okay. Yosef Ben Yeah. Come on. Asa Hilliard. Okay. Okay. Kim Hotel. That's good. Okay. Julius Neary. Julius okay. Neary. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we want to call on all those to come join us who wish to come join us, and we recognize that many of them are in us. Winnie Mandela. Winnie Mandela, yes. And we want to call on all those who names we may not know who wish to come join us to help us in this fight moving forward. As the right action honorable Marcus Mosai Garvey said, look for him in the whirlwind to be the real Marcus Garvey yeah. and to bring countless millions of ancestors with him to help us in this battle against this pus 
of the system of white supremacy that we are battling against. So I say, Ashe. 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 Very good, y'all. Now, now we're going to do this Kwanzaa, and, and, and I know most of the people here know about Kwanzaa. So we have to talk about 1966, right? Everybody knows Kwanzaa was created out on the West Coast, right? Everybody knows that, right? Yeah. Oh, you didn't know that. Okay, good, brother. So in 1966, Dr. Milana Karenga, through the organization called Us, and it was some other people as well, and I'm not going to get all into the other folk, but that's how Kwanzaa came out of Kawaida. So the seven principles of Kwanzaa were already, the seven principles were established, and they were incorporated into a universal uh, uh, practice called Kwanzaa. Now, I told you earlier, I'm not dealing with individuals. For those people that got issues with Dr. Karinga, hey, y'all let that go. This is a universal celebration that has now gone all over the world. And if you didn't hear me on WL the other day and Baba Lumumba, what we were talking about was the importance of us recognizing that there is no other holy days or days that we celebrate that were created to bring all of us into the nucleus of unity. There's not any. And then some folks say, well, Kwanzaa was created. But y'all know any holy days or holidays that weren't created? No. Nope. <laughs> so the reality is, is the seven principles are very universal. And it's primarily for black people, African people, Nubian people, Akabalanian people, all these nomenclatures we got. We know that Kwanzaa represents unity, and we want to write like that candle. Now, what is unity? Umoja. No. Julius Nayeri is primarily responsible with us even talking about Kishwahili. Y'all know that, right? Y'all know? Dr. Julius Nayeri from Tanzania? Yeah. Anyway, we're going to get into that later because that's one of the people, <laughs> one of the ancestors we're serious about. But anyway, <laughs> due to that, come on in here, Kalichi, my brother. You got those calendars, man. You can pass, make sure everybody here got one. So it's important for us to recognize that if we're standing on the shoulders of our ancestors and we talk about unity, the unity is critical. Now, up here we have a, a you might not be able to, you're going to see it when I light it, but this canara is a Sankofa, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to go back and fetch it and to go forward. So without any further ado, y'all know what unity means, right? Yes, to strive right. for what? Right. Building what? In, 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 building in yourself, your family, your community, your nation, and we know what nation we're talking about, right? And your race, right? So without any further ado, when I light the candle and say a bar of of unity, which was yesterday, and it was awesome, Brother Kalichi. Y'all did a remarkable job at organizing, brother. I just want to say that real quickly while I'm running through this candlelight service. I got to, I got to hit y'all up over in the northeast, and I got to go down to uh, Thurgood Marshall. I didn't get over to Union Temple. I wanted to get there, too, but that was a little too far to travel. But it was awesome, Kalichi. <laughs> and I, uh, brother, D.C. is known, the world should be watching how Banneker City celebrates Kwanzaa. But anyway, without any further ado, when I light the candle like Barbara Rafo say, you know, it's Kwanzaa time, y'all know what to say when y'all see the fire, right? Mm. Did y'all know who Baba Rafo was? Yay Bo. Yay Bo. Huh? Yay Bo. African people, it's Kwanzaa time. Yay Bo. Yay Bo. African people, it's Kwanzaa time. Yay Bo. Yay Bo. African people, it's Kwanzaa time. Yay Bo. Kwanzaa time. African people, it's Kwanzaa time. Yay Bo. Yay Bo. That's Baba. That's Baba Rafo left that with us. But anyway, I'm going to light this candle right quick. And we light the black first. Okay, y'all see the fire? Yes, yes. Umoja. 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 You're right. Now, <laughs> we're going to talk tonight about the importance of unity. But tonight is self-determination. So, Kalichi, I think I'm going to do this right. I know, I, I know it's the red, but I, I like to go all the way over. I don't like to do the one right next to the black. So, anyway, uh, if, that's, if that's not correct, but, you know, correct me. But that's how I like to do it. I go all the way over to, the, to this side. And when, when I like this one, y'all know what to say, right? Yeah. One of the most powerful Kiswahili words on the planet. Right. And one thing, uh, little children remember <coughs> like this one. So, anyway, y'all going to all say it when I like it? All right, there you go. Kuju Chakalia. Kuju Chakalia. Say it again. Kuju Chakalia. 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 Self determination. Self determination. Self determination. So anyway, 
That's, that's good, y'all. Now, I want to thank the, 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 the D.C. Uh, Kwanzaa Planning Committee for allowing us to host this night because historically, even before Kwanzaa was uh, established in 1958, Kwame Nkrumah called together the All-African People's Conference in Ghana. How many did not know that? Y'all show your hands. Don't be ashamed. Okay. It's important because, you know, Ghana got its independence a little before that, right? In 1957, right? Is that right? Right? So immediately after Ghana got its independence, Kwame Nkrumah called the All African People's Conference and called leaders from around the, 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 the country to come. And guess what? The President General of the UNIA was there. William Sherr was there. So not only African leaders on the continent, he called leaders from everywhere to that conference, and they conferenced and set things in motion. I'm not going to go any further because I, I, I know Brother Bailey, and we might talk about that later. But that's important because that was 60 years ago. Mm. And 60 years ago, Kwame Nkrumah's objective was, just like Marcus Garvey said, he said, don't give me an island, I want a continent. He said, I don't want Jamaica, I want a continent. <laughs> Kwame Nkrumah said the same thing. He said, Ghana cannot... Africa cannot really totally be free unless all of Africa is free. So he called this conference, and it's important. Well, just recently, the 60th anniversary was celebrated. At the same days, December the 8th through the 13th, 60 years ago, 1958. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you all about what happened between 1958. How many were born at that time? How many were born? Cliff, Blam, Bam. Few of us in this room were born. But the fact of the matter is, we was on our way to get some, li what we call liberation on yeah. the continent. Y'all know what I'm saying? What, Garvey left in 1940. So years after that, the revolution was rolling. You know, liberation on the continent, country after country. And from 1957 all the way up to when so many of the countries got their independence, it was serious business. So Mr. Charlie was like, oh my goodness, we ain't going to have this capitalist ability to get all these resources if these countries get control of their own destiny. So what happened? They started, they come here, they come here. They started killing people. They murdered Patrice Lumumba. Yeah. And so many others. I mean, I believe Samor Michel, it's so many that they murdered. And it went all the way up to 1987. And my brother Thomas Sankara. The, the centennial year of Marcus Garvey, while we was in Jamaica, we got the news that Thomas Sankara had been murdered. Mm. Thomas Sankara, with just four years, <coughs> started changing the whole paradigm of how people looked at unity. He came to Harlem and said that Harlem was his White House, or his Black House, and you got you to check Sa Thomas Sankara out, because for, for real, he changed the name of the country, he changed the culture, he, changed, he was one of the, uh, my sister Afiang Afiang, and I'm going to stop shortly, but my no, sister Afiang Afiang, who's from Nigeria, she said that he was the baddest womanist on the planet. Mm. Thomas Sankara was the baddest womanist on the planet. You know what? He empowered the black women. And so Thomas Sankara, even today, the contingency, and I don't know whether you, you saw it, but David Horn told me that the strong youth contingency that came from his country was off the chain. Yeah. They walked in like, and, you know, pow, because they understand that when Thomas Sankara was assassinated, that you could not assassinate the spiritual Thomas Sankara. <laughs> and by the way, we're going to be, the Pan-African Fellas Movement is going to be doing a Thomas Sankara Day yeah. every year in October mm -hmm. from now on in D.C. Hey, maybe. I missed the last one. Uh, the last one was uh, the first weekend in October. It was over there on Adams Morgan off of... Um, on Columbia Road, I believe, right? Right, on Columbia yeah. Road, right. the Festival Center. Yeah. So, so it's very important, though, for us, because our young people need to know these ancestors. And we need to recognize those of us who've been around that we may not be above dirt when the real revolution is completed. Now, that's a reality we have to accept. But we have to pass that information on. And Kwanzaa is a perfect... Um, paradigm for us to build from. Because when you say unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, uh, Nia, purpose, creativity, Iman, I mean, and then Imani, faith. Those, those principles are so powerful, and they're universal principles, but they're powerful for us to work on ourselves. 
So anyway, in closing, this candlelighting ceremony, I was supposed to share a few words with you because being born here in Vatican City, I started celebrating Kwanzaa uh, in 1968 when I was in, you know, was in, was in 11th grade, going to the 12th grade. And for me, the shrine of the Black, uh, uh, not the shrine of Black Madonna, excuse me, but the temple of, uh, uh, the temple of Black Messiah with Reverend um, Shaka Musa and Mama Nia, who's still with us. They, it was still a legend in our community. They were powerful. And they made sure that D.C. continued what was happening on the West Coast. And Kwanzaa has been kicking ever since. Ujima Shule, Watoto Shule, Roots, Le uh, Roots uh, Learning Center and also Roots Activity Learning Center. And what we're here to talk about tonight, we want to make sure that be clear when we say the Pan-African Federalist Movement, we're not renewing the revolution. <laughs> we're not renewing or creating a new organization. It's a movement. And we want all organizations and institutions to continue doing what they're doing, but be connected globally. And not necessarily meaning that everybody is going to help do the hard work. Right, Brother Bailey? <laughs> but, but we represent all African people. And if you don't know the history of Pan-Africanism, it didn't start with W.E.B. Du Bois, <laughs> Henry Sylvester Williams, <coughs> and some people always leave out Anna Julia Cooper. Have y'all ever heard of Anna Julia Cooper? Yeah. Well, Anna Julia Cooper taught Nanny Helen Burroughs. Anna Julia Cooper taught at Dunbar High School. Anna Julia Cooper was working with Henry Sylvester Williams. Sometimes we always talk about the brothers and we leave out the powerful women. But Tony Martin told me well. He's like, Singo, it ain't no revolution nowhere, not with no people, that has not been led by women and young people. The older brothers catch hold, just like South Africa. That's a good example. <laughs> you know, the sisters were like, we, we get rid of these pasts. They, they burned. So they ignited the brothers who were subject to be actually killed if they didn't go to work. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But it started with the sisters. So let's be very clear that what we see happening in the world now is interesting. But the leader that was just elected of the IPC, the International <laughs> Planning Committee, is Sister Kathy out of South Africa, mm. a sister. And Brother Jume, who pulled all of us in, I think is the assistant. And we're going to run that down to everybody, explain what I'm talking about. Because initially, back in 2014, during the centennial of the UNIA, there was a group of brothers in Senegal and sisters who decided that we got to get back to what Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyeri, Sekou Touré, even Joma Kenyatta, even though he went way left field <laughs> later on, he was there early, and I mean a whole lot of others, laid out <coughs> for unified Africa. So the Organization of African Unity, which you're not going to hear a lot about tonight, was established, and let's don't leave out Haile Selassie. Because sometimes people try to leave the emperor Haile Selassie out when he, when he housed the first gathering in Ethiopia. And I'm not getting into all that. I mean, people, you know, you know, I love the Rastafari. But the reality, and we're talking about what these leaders did collectively for the sake of building Africa. We're not talking about the shortcomings of them or the differences that they had. We're talking about the things that they work for in common. And you see today Ethiopia and, and Eritrea is now, right, that's deep, ain't it? In 1991, when Eritrea got their independence, we were having our convention in Los Angeles, and they were right there celebrating. Mm. But so it's some interesting things going on. And in Rwanda, most of the people that run the country now are black, are, are Rwanda women. Did y'all know that? No. Yes. 80%. So there's something happening, and we need to recognize it. And I'm not talking feminism, I'm talking womanism. And that's no offense to feminism, y'all. Womanism is when black women stand up and say, we sick and tired, like Fannie Lou Hamer said, of being sick and tired. So uh, I just want to say, as, as one who's grown up here in DC and study uh, the Kwanzaa movement, it's beautiful. Right now, they're having one in my house, <laughs> right now. Because uh, certain things happen, a brother transition, 
and uh, they wanted to pull together a lot of the young people who grew up under his tutelage, Brother Ibrahim, in Senegal. And so consequently, that, that's what's happening in my house. But I had to be here with the Pan-African Fellows Movement. I've been working with the Pan-African Fellows Movement since uh, at least over a year. Back in May, we held our first gathering at the Davis Center, and we had brothers and sisters that came from everywhere and came to the Davis Center. How many here was there at the Davis Center? You were there, Ms. Mira. Y'all, we were there. Well, t- I'm telling y'all that from that, we were planning for this pre-Congress coming up that came just recently in December. And trust me, people came from Canada, from Philadelphia, from Atlanta, Chicago. from Chicago, Florida, from Florida, from L.A. Well, yeah, I said L.A. Atlanta. And, and, oh, and, and, and a brother actually came from Africa. Mm-hmm. And so, in Paris. Exactly, in Paris, right. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm making to you all is it's been organizing. We've been organizing. And to set the stage for my brother Bailey and and brother Sam, who is the leader of the legal, uh, the local initiating committee of this area, brother Sam is. Over 80% of the people that registered at the conference in Ghana were young people. Well, You know, that's what I was told by, you know, my brother. Because the key with that is young people are very hungry. All over. East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, South Africa. So anyway, Brother Bailey is is my elder. And uh, he had the experience of getting there. Brother Sam and I were supposed to get there. We didn't get there. I'm not getting all into those details. (laughs) But we were definitely chartered to be there. Uh, the brother that is the head of Rick North America, which as Brother Bailey has always stressed to us, we are a continent. And we have to look at ourselves as a continent when we have eight RICs, I think, around the world. Eight regional uh, initiated committees around the world. They're in the UK, all over Africa, in the Caribbean, in so-called Latin America, and then what is considered the United States and Canada is Rick North America. Well, the brother that is head of that, Brother Amaseta, also known as Edward Brown, is in Florida. And uh, he was at the conference and he did a workshop. Later on, you're going to hear from my brother Bailey. He's going to explain to you not only what happened at the conference, but his experience. Because the good news about Brother Bailey getting there, and he'll tell you, he, he stopped flying a long time ago. <laughs> But he got on a plane to go to this. <coughs> and he took one of Malcolm's daughters, well, he, he, he invited her, and she went. So Samir Krumah, who is in Ghana, and remember I told you about the Senegalese connection, right? And Brother Jume and Brother Amadou Sek, who is out, uh, you know, works with the leadership of Rick. Well, Brother, Brother, Brother Bailey chose to fly there, and uh, Malcolm's daughter was there. And Samir Krumah, was primarily instrumental in organizing and connecting us to the Kwame Nkrumah uh, 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 Institute along with the Pan-African Feminist Movement. So it's very important to understand Garveyites were there from all over, even from Belize, all over the place, but not just Garveyites. And I want to make it clear to you, we're not dealing with I'm into this or I'm into that. We're dealing with the issue that relates to the lack of pan-African federalism or pan-African functionalism in practical application. Meaning, we can disagree, but we can't afford to be disagreeable. Because that feeds the other fellow. And the divide, and this is important, the continent itself. It's a continent. All this divided country thing was broken up by the, at the Berlin Conference. I mean, you shouldn't have to get a visa and a passport to go from one country to the other country in our, in our country. And look, Africans here, have, we are expatriates. And it's a whole lot of expatriates that are in Ghana and other places. Uh, my brother Haru Forai Alta is in East Africa now, just bought land in Tanzania and living in Rwanda. So you see, Pan- and you're not going to get this on the news, but their brothers and sisters making moves. So if you want to expatriate, you want to be an expatriate, 
It's ways and means you can do that. Brother Bailey also got to visit a place, Jerry's place, a brother who's a Garveyite, who has been there, what, about 14, 13, some odd years? 14. 14 and married to a guy named sister. I was able to go to that place. But Ramban Nee was there two weeks ago, or two weeks before you got there. And many people have gone there. They got an ancestral wall in Prom Prom Ghana. That's incredible. It's incredible. And expatriates are all over the place. They, they're all over the place in Ghana. And the right to abode. And let me, let me close on this point. Ghana is calling for this 2019 right to return. Year of return. Year of return. It didn't just start. <laughs> Sister Amicus with One Africa been there almost 40 years. So, but it's a, it's, a, it's a method to try to get Africans to do the kind of stuff my brother Diallo Sumbri and some other folks are doing, taking young people to Africa so people understand Africa is not, uh, you know, <laughs> well, I ain't going to go there, but y'all know how it was when we were young, how people made us think Africa was. It ain't like that. So anyway, Kwanzaa time is a very important time. Today, we're going to focus on uh, the Pan-African Federalist Movement and why we did this on Kuju Chocolatea Day, why we chose to come to We Act Radio. I want, I want everybody to put a black hand together for Brother Kamon of We Act Radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he demonstrated self-determination. Now, I, I all, and I'm not going to go all into the story, but I mean, he's here. We Act Radio is here. And I applaud you. I think yesterday y'all did a book drive thing where you gave books away. I mean, Southeast D.C., Martin Luther King Avenue, that's, 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 that, 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 is, that is institutional. Building. And then right next door, that's building institutions. That's self-determination. So we want everybody to feel a connectedness to the Pan-African Fellows Movement. Uh, there's some chairs up here, my sister. You can come on up. There's a couple chairs up here. Y'all don't have to sit in the back. Y'all can come on up. So I'm excited, and I want to, like, like Sam said, I want y'all to feel at home. I want you to ask the kind of questions, and if we can't answer it, we will work to get the kind of answers that you may need. Is that not right, Sam? Definitely. So if it's okay with you, Brother Bailey, if I, I covered a little bit during the question and answer period. I'm going to turn it back over to my good brother Sam because what I want y'all to leave here with is understanding of what the Pan-African Federalist Movement is, and you probably will hear this word Pan-African Federalist, uh, uh, Pan-African Federalist Congress. And I told some people the other day that uh, don't take what we're doing lightly, but we're not interested in a lot of numbers of people. We're interested in people answering the call, continuing doing what you do, and being connected to brothers and sisters like you all over the world. Because one of the most important things you should learn from today is the only thing we're lacking in this war on us is enough power to get on the offensive and win. We got everything, y'all. We the best artists. We the best athletes. We the best all. We got all that going on, but the, uh, uh, somebody else is profiting from it. As other people are profiting from the land in Africa. And get this, you may not ever go to Africa, but Africa is going to come to you once we control the resources. Because Africa is the most wealthiest continent in the world. The people are impoverished because other people are taking out all the resources of Africa back to their countries. We would not use this at all if it were not for the blood that has been run in the Congo. You would not be driving an automobile with five stone tires if it were not for the blood and sweat of the young people who work on the plantation of Firestone's plantation in Liberia, Ismira, that they don't even own, that was earmarked for the Garvey movement. Yes. So we have to understand that we have to get busy changing the paradigm and switching things. And don't be afraid. The opposite of fear is love. No, I'm serious, because they already are exterminating our brothers and sisters. And I'm not advocating, you know, anything other than you exercising your blacktricity. Raise it up. All that's going on, don't put all your energy in what's going on with 45. Forget that. 
No, I'm serious. Forget that. I'm not, so, I'm not talking about don't be conscious of what's happening, but don't put all your energy into what's going on and whether they're going to get rid of him or all of this. Because ain't no president and crew Barack Obama ever got in the White House practicing Kucha Chaka Leo for African people. No, That's just not real. In fact, we would not have Donald Trump if we didn't get Obama. I mean, think about that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, without any further ado, and, and we can get down to the local politics too. Yes, sir. All right? Yes, because sir. be very clear, just because you got black politicians, if they're not working on issues in this war that we're in right now, we really better take a close, close look at what the so-called black faces in high places mm. are doing, compromising with the other fella. Hey. Sam wanted me to touch on that because D.C. still is a democratic town, but it's still a low voter turnout and everything. And consequently, the people that we really want to win normally don't. And folks outside of this area who put money into the city, and I know what I'm talking about because I, uh, the first mayor of this city that was black was in the church that I grew up with, Walter Washington. And so we got to be very clear. I'm not talking about the first mayor. The first mayor was white in the city. Most people don't know that. They appointed a mayor way back longer, but he was the first black man. So every mayor, and of course we love Marion Barry. Marion Barry came through SNCC, and we know he did the best he could. But the reality is that the politicians are not practicing Kuchu Chakalia. Anyway, thank you. Let's give him a hand, y'all. Let's give him a hand. Baba Sango, I really, really appreciate that. And I'm just going to use the mic because I don't have a voice quite like yours. Um, but what you were saying just now uh, provides the perfect foundation for what I would like to speak about in terms of Pan-African federalism. And this goes back to what I said in my opening remarks earlier, just connecting what Baba A. Peter Bailey is going to drop on us tonight. Pan, that idea of Pan-African federalism in just local politics, what do all of those have to do with one another? And not to forget Kuchi Chagalia, right? So let's revisit Kuchi Chagalia real quick, all right? And I'm going to do my best to organize what I want to say in my head because it's just so much that I want to impart on y'all to make it as simple as possible. And it's very simple, right? Once you understand Kuchi Chagalia and Pan Africanism. Now, um, anybody in here younger than 20, by any chance, or in their early 20s? Let's do 20s. All right, so my 20 year olds, all right? Kuji Chagalia, what does that mean? Self determination. Self determination. What does self determination mean exactly? I say, right? So determining your own path, charting your own path. Any of the takers about Kuji Chagalia? I think a lot of it, self-determination, also has to do with uh, having the right knowledge, because you don't you don't want to make your determination off of nothing. Mm -hmm. So it has to have a base that is rooted, usually, hopefully, within your own culture and actual knowledge of the world, so that you can really make a self-determining decision. Exactly. So what we're talking about here as a Black African family is being able to chart our own path, right? To make our own destiny. And I would like to add to what my fellow uh, so-called millennials said, defining ourselves as black African people. Who are we? What is our culture? What are our social norms? What is it that we do as a family? When we're talking about organizing, how is it that we organize? Do we organize according to their paradigm or do we set a new paradigm, right? And when we're talking about Kuji Chagalia, you have to understand that self-determination is a human rights issue. It's not just civil rights, we're talking about human rights. How can I as a human being, once I am out of the womb in this realm, how am I able to chart my own path without obstruction from the powers that be? And the honest answer to that is, for at least 400 years, we as black African people on this continent have not been able to do that. And that continues to this day because we collectively have not been able to grasp this idea of human rights, being able to be sovereign over our own affairs and being able to control our own destiny as black African people, not only as a nation, but as singular families and as individuals. But how can we control our destiny 
if we don't even control our education systems, if we don't control where our water come from, if we don't control our media, right? If we don't control who gets in the office, if we don't control various aspects of our lives, how are we able to do that? But I also have another bomb to drop on y'all, right? We're not the only ones in this world who are going through similar issues. The fact remains that because we're locked down here, there are people all around the world who look just like us, who have common lineage back to the mama Africa, who are going through similar situations. It's along the lines of what Kwame Nkrumah call neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism. Now, for those of us who don't know what neocolonialism and neoliberalism is, it's a system, right, where they make you feel that you're independent nominally. Mm -hmm. So you're only independent in name, okay? You have your own city, you might have your own organization, you might have heads of state, people who are in power, who look just like you, who were voted in democratically, so they say. But at the very same time, in this day and age, we have corporations who are running the show, okay? We have corporations, you know, it might be about six or so of them, who control every aspect of our lives, who at a moment's notice are able to pour money, okay, into various facets of the people who control what we do, who are able to manipulate our existence on this earth. And they are the ones who are competing against people in our community, the small business owners, right? When you're thinking about people who, you know, um, who make shirts, who make jewelry, who make, you know, wares and different things like that for our community that you see vending throughout, you got to think about, and uh, this is for my economics folks, the means to production, right? Where are they getting the material from? Who's the plug that's helping them get everything wholesale before they sell it? Is it a black African face? If they want to find a black African person to buy wholesale material from, where are they going to get it from? Oftentimes, the answer is not as simple as it seems, and that's because of neo neocolonialism. That's because of what the market has done over the last few decades or so to concentrate power within the hands of the few. Now, Sam, you've been rapping for a very long time about international issues. What does this have to do with D.C.? Okay, I'm about to break it down to y'all. Okay, what happened on Sheriff Road in front of the barbershop this past summer? Okay, we're talking about the gentrification here. How is it that we're always the last ones to know about what's going on, right? Even with people in power who mean well, we're always the last ones to know what's going on, right? How is it that you have people, you can't even get a loan now for a bank. You have to go through hoops and hurdles to get a bank loan. Even if you own a small business, you understand? They want to see tax information. They want to know the name of your first and last born. They want to know A, B, and C, and D about you, right? Even with the black banks, okay? The black banks are backed by white institutions, white-owned institutions. So no matter where we go as black African people in D.C., we're caught up in a corner where we're not quite self-determined just yet. And let's break it down even further, right? You have a D.C. council which revoked the vote, right? Now understand, right, there might have been, you know, some qualms with, you know, the bill or whatever the case is. I, too, had my qualms. But when you have a legislative body that takes back the vote of the people. You understand? If the people approved something by a 10 point margin and then the legislators vote to take it back, we have an issue on our hands where people don't feel self-determined and they don't have faith in the system. And that is quite evident by the voter turnout that just happened in the June 19th primary. I believe in at least Ward 8, it was in the single digits across the city among our people. It was a little higher, but still not significant. Okay, so there are a lot of issues. We're talking about K2, right? So how is it that even with the laws in place, store owners are still able to sell K2 in majority black places and people are nodding off in public spaces and people aren't doing what they're supposed to do? These are issues that are political in nature, but we are very scared of politics because we've been misinformed about politics. Politics isn't just about debating and voting and this and this and that. It's about organizing. And for the last 40 years or so, since we all became conscious, or at least those of us of the generation before me, we've been doing some mobilizing and we've been doing some organizing. But the issue is keeping our institutions open and passing that knowledge from one generation to another and making sure that everybody who's doing the same thing are organized and can exchange resources toward one common goal. So today's presentation is twofold. 
The first is to give Bobby A. Peter Bailey a platform to speak about his Ghana experience and to speak about the issues at hand. And the second is to put it out there for those of y'all in the audience and those of y'all watching on Facebook to answer the call for Pan-African federalism. Federalism meaning that we're organized under one banner of a black African nation and that every so-called nation state under that organization is geared towards making sure that the people have the power in their hands. Because what has happened since our nominal independence on the continent the powers that be have installed leaders that are greedy, that want to starve the people, especially the young people, that want to take the NGO money and build mansions mm -hmm. instead of taking that money and investing in communities, building infrastructure, building education. And the same thing is happening here. We have crumbling infrastructure for places in America. Bring any African immigrant over here and have them ride a lift. They will tell you there are more homeless people here than they thought. I've heard it with my own eyes, and I've seen it with my own ears. The same thing's happening here. But the question is, how are we going to organize as black African people in D.C. toward the common goal of taking hold of our own destiny? All right? And you have to understand that we're going not for a United States of Africa, but for united African states. There's a clear difference. Break that up, break it up. Break clear it up. difference. Break it up for them. The fact remains that we all come from Africa. Pangea, y'all, okay? There was some truth in what they taught us in school. So we're all spread across the world. So this here, D.C., the little bit of chocolate city that's left is an African state. Baltimore City is an African state. Chicago, Illinois is an African state. But the question is, are we organized like an African state? At this point, when people have a clear understanding of pan-Africanism, especially with the immigration and immigration happening across the Atlantic and wherever else, people understand now more than ever our common African heritage. So we have more leeway now, or we should have more leeway, right, to take advantage and build amongst ourselves pretty much a federation. And my question to you tonight, for those of y'all who are in here is, are you guys gonna be a part of building that federation? Are you guys gonna look within yourselves, right? And figure out your talents, what you have to give, and decide to become a part of that federation. Now, like Baba Sangor said, nobody's telling you to do more than what you're doing already. That's asinine, that's very stupid. There's more work than we have time for. That's right. The answer is to organize. We're talking organization. You're doing what you're doing in the education realm? Perfect. Keep doing it. But understand that you have people in the same realm who are doing the same thing. You need resources from them? Y'all trade resources. If somebody in the banking realm needs something, we need to confer with the education room, organizing around that. What are our goals that we're going to set for 2019? How can people in each realm help us work toward those goals? It's not extra work. It's being organized. But it's a matter of if you're willing to answer that call. If you're not, no hard feelings. But if you are, let's get down and dirty. Because 2019 is going to bring town halls, gatherings, planning around how we as a black African nation in D.C. can organize everything that we have toward building sovereignty, not just here, but all around the world. And one more point before I wrap up. Pan-African federalism is not only a matter of human rights, it's a matter of diplomacy. There's a reason why, you understand? There's a reason why in New York, after that Asian police officer gunned down the brother, in the project stairwell, and when he got when he got convicted, and those Chinese people came out there in the streets and protested, there's a reason why he got off. Do you guys know why? Because them Chinese people are backed by a whole country across the Atlantic Ocean. Who's backing us over here? Hmm? Who's pressuring the African leaders across the Atlantic to look over here at us, what we're going through, to figure out the similarities? Who? Very few people. Julius Malema spoke on it publicly, right, in recent months, right? But other than him and a few others, who else is doing it? Who's pressuring the young people? Or what young people here among us are organized to pressure the leadership to bend stuff toward our will? Or are we asleep at the wheel until it's time to vote? And even those of us talking about voting, we're always using scaremongering tactics, right? 
forgetting that we've all been kept, we, that we've all been caught in the Babylon hell. So I'm going to stop here for now because we have a whole presentation to go through and a whole interview. I'm asking y'all tonight. Think about answering that call. There was a whole signing sheet that just went around. I need a name and I need phone numbers, phones that work. Y'all pay that bill. Y'all make sure that when I call y'all, y'all answer the phone. No emails because I ignore emails too or I, or, 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 or I answer them later on. We need names and phone numbers because we're going to follow up and we're going to build <coughs> Our part of the Federation here in D.C., it's time to not just talk about Kuji Chagalia, but work toward it. Okay. So, several points to run back down before I shut my mouth, all right? Self-determination, right? Creating a name for ourselves, all right? And we're talking about diplomacy, all right? We're talking about backing from other black African nations and organizing so that when something happens over here, people are willing to step up on our behalf. Because we stepped up on our own behalf. Can I get an ashe? Ashe. All right, family. That's all that I got to say tonight as far as Pan-African Federalism and Kuji Chagalia. But best believe, it's not over just yet. Once again, please sign the sheet that just came out. We're talking about town halls all across D.C., at least in the majority black parts, where people can talk about what's going on and we can develop an agenda for 2019 as far as Pan-African Federalism is concerned. Let me make a point about that. Yes, sir. And then we come in, Brother Bear. This point, this important, uh, Brother Cliff is in the back. And, and, and one of the things I want y'all to be really clear on, if you're not ready to deal with the federalism aspect of things and building, in those town hall meetings, you can come talk about different things. We will be partnering, Brother Cliff, with the Sixth Region Diaspora Caucus that is doing exactly what the African Union asked us to do in terms of organizing. So I hope y'all understand what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the town hall meeting is, is, is designed for us to come together and work and organize, and organizations are not invited by the African Union. Civil societies are. Right, Brother Cliff? Now, Brother Cliff has already started doing that kind of thing in Tubman City, and other people have started doing that. Brother Cliff also is gonna be working with the Pan-African Fellows Movement, but what I'm trying to say to you all is, we want to go through every door that's got a crack in it. Got me? And like he said, we don't just want to put pressure on local politicians. We're going to put pressure on international politicians. And when I say we, I'm not talking about necessarily D.C. I'm talking about the Africans in Ghana, the Africans in Liberia, who not getting just due of the land, food, clothing, and shelter. They have every right of the people, based on human right, to put pressure on their leadership, right? So the Pan-African Federalist Movement is a little different, but it's clearly about bringing us together around self-determination and not expecting them to do, just do, but doing it ourselves. Y'all hear me? Y'all yeah. got me? Yeah. So, so, so this should be open to everybody that wants change. That's African, the town hall meetings. Because brother, brother, uh, brother Sam is going to be working with my brother Cliff. Uh, they have a council of elders in Baltimore. I've seen them at work. But this is also happening across the country, different other places. So when he was talking about us getting support from Africa, we can also get support from Chicago. We can get support from Tubman City. We can get support from different other areas. That's extremely important in unity and self-determination. I'm gonna pass the mic back to my brother now. I wanted y'all to be clear, because sometimes people, he gave, you a, he gave you an option. I'm saying you don't have an option. <laughs> you got an option to come be a part of this, or you got an option to be a part of that. You came to Kwanzaa, you bought self-determination, your options are left or right. Because we are serious about understanding that we may disagree, but we don't got time to be disagreeable. And I know when Brother Elder, Elder Bailey finished with us, you're going to best understand where Malcolm was leading us. All right, family. Um, let's get one big ashe off everything that was just said, y'all. All right, back. Now, I need a timekeeper, y'all. What time is it, family? 7.24. All right, 7.24. All right. Um, what time should Q&A be? Uh, I want to make this as natural as possible by 8.30. Yep, 8.30. All right, 8.30 Q&A is good. We're going to give Baba Peter um, 
one hour of our time. It'll just be a strict conversation, right? Real nice Q&A. But, Baba Peter, um, we're going to set this up because we're going to hold the mic. No problem. I know we're going to get to some of this stuff, right? Good evening, brothers and sisters. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm very uh, honored and happy to be with you uh, this evening to talk about uh, my trip to uh, my recent trip to Ghana as a part of the Pan African Federalist Movement. And, uh, but before I before I do, I think I should give a little bit of perspective where I personally am now in terms of how we as a people should function. See, my thing now is that. We really, I'm no longer interested in what, blaming the white man, the Asians, all those kind of folks. I think when people come to me now and say that, look what the police did to that boy. You know what I say? This is what happens to a group of people who resolutely refuse to organize a national movement to promote and protect their interests. And that's my position now. Look what they did over here. This is what happens to a group of people who resolutely, because we have refused to organize a unified national movement in this country and around to promote and protect it. And if you don't do that, there's a consequence. When people say, we well, don't black people ain't gonna do that, then my response is, then pay the consequences. Now that, and that's the way I am now. I'm not, I'm no longer, you know, maybe people say I sound harsh, but that's the way I am now. And, and dealing with, and same with the Africans. When I went uh, to the Pan-African Federalism Movement, uh, Congress in Ghana, first of all, it was, it was difficult for me to get there because I have not been under an airplane since 1985. I had decided that I was never going to get on another airplane as long as I lived. Uh, although I had been, before that I would made that decision, I had been to uh, uh, East Africa, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Mexico City, Cairo, and different places around the country. I had already flown. And it wasn't really, a, I was always a bad flyer, never liked flying. But I did it because I, you know, with my job, I was, I was with Ebony Magazine at the time. I was a staffer with Ebony Magazine. And, uh, and then one day, a friend of mine, she had a flight that left her for about three weeks, totally messed up. And when I saw it, I said, that's it. No more flights. And, and uh, I went on this trip for two reasons. For three reasons, mainly because I really wanted to go to the Pan-African Federalist Congress because of the opportunity to meet people of African descent from around the world. Number two, uh, I wanted to go to Elmina. It was an opportunity to, to go to the, the door of no return in, uh, in Ghana, El, uh, El, Elmina, they call it. I, I wanted to experience that because people I know who had experienced it had told me about it, how, uh, how powerful it was. And number three, my close friends and my family members told me I was getting on that airplane if they had to tie me down, drag me to the plane, and tie me in my seat, uh, uh, that I was going to get be on that plane going to, uh, going to Ghana. And, uh, and number four, it was a direct flight. Believe me, if it had not been a direct flight, I would not have gone. Because I don't like going up and then coming down and then got to go up again. So, I, so we went from, uh, from, from Dulles to Accra in about, about eight hours. And, and, and guess what I flew on? South Africa Airways. I mean, that was a real something flying on South Africa Airways. To, and the plane was going from a, from Dulles to Accra, then from Accra to Johannesburg. I must say that both going and coming was two of the smoothest flights I've ever been on in my life. Though when I first saw the plane, I you know I was still flying back when they didn't have those. I stopped flying before they started having what they call these air buses. So when I came out there and saw that, I said, man, there's nowhere in the world that this thing with five or 600 people and all those suitcases is going to get off the ground. But it did, and uh, it was very smooth all the way. We had about maybe 30 seconds of turbulence going and about 30 seconds coming back, a little bit of shaking. And other than that, you know, it was, it was a great flight. I, I, when I got on the plane, I sat down in my seat, I closed my eyes, and I didn't open them up until they say, you can now unbelt, unfasten your seat belts. <laughs> That's what I finally said. But uh, it was worth all of that, you know. It was worth all of that because the, the, the Pan-African Federalist uh, uh, pre-Congress in Ghana was worth it. I had an opportunity to meet black people from all over the world. 
I had never met any black people from Cape Verde. I met these two young brothers from Cape Verde who are, who are strong Pan-Africanists in a place that they say is Portuguese. It was you know, controlled by the Portuguese. And, and, uh, and Pan-Africanism is very frowned on there. In fact, to the extent of this, I had never heard before. These two young brothers told me that in Cape Verde, you can change your name to a French name, a German name, a Russian name, a Chinese name, but it is illegal not socially a problem, illegal to change your name to an African name. As these young brothers told me about Cape Verde. Now, I, I, you know, I have to take that word for They live there and they're serious. But uh, I had never heard that before. And then I met a sister from Argent who came from Argentina, and she told me, I knew there were some black people in Argentina, but, but I thought it was a you know, small group. She said, no, there are over 2 million people of African descent in Argentina. But said the government acts as though we don't exist. Mm -hmm. So she was there. There was a sister from Mexico, uh, representing the black people from uh, from Mexico, and and her, her family has founded an Africana Mexicana museum in Acapulco. Mm -hmm. And she wanted. She said, "I hope you would be able to come to to visit our, our museum." Uh, I said, "Well, I've heard about you know, of course, about black folks in Mexico, but this, they now have have a museum." that tells the history of black people in Mexico that this young lady's family uh, launched. And I told her that well, if I can get to Acapulco on the train, I will uh, I'll come down uh, to Acapulco to, uh, to see this museum. I met a brother from Belize. I talked to people from, from you know, Canada and black people from Germany and, and England and Niger and Nigeria. And I mean, I talked to black people from at least 25 different countries while I was there. And that was absolutely, you know, one of the great, great things about being at that, at that, uh, at that Congress, to talk to people from all these different people, all these different areas, and see how committed they were to the concept of Pan-Africanism and Pan-African federalism. Uh, this right here is a t-shirt that was the official t-shirt for the event. Uh, and it was called Africa Must Unite. Now, I don't know what these brothers think, but they've never had any larger than, than extra large. So I couldn't get one that fit me. So I, I said, well, I'll just buy one anyway, maybe give it to my grandson. But I never could get one that fit me because they, they wouldn't. I said, you know, there's some people, you know, who are like 2X and 3X, that kind of thing, you know, but they, uh -huh. they, but they only had, the first they went up is, is extra large. So uh, I finally bought one, you know, to give to my, uh, to my, to my grandson. But... Uh, it was a powerful event. Now, uh, on opening day, the president of Ghana was there. That was my second time hearing him speak because I was attending a press conference in New York. I think it was in November in which the Ghanaians announced uh, what they call the year of return. Ghana is making a serious concert, concerted effort to get people from this country, people of African descent from this country, to come to Ghana in 2019. They say for two reasons. One, to celebrate the resilience of, of African people, and two, to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the first African people coming to what is now North America. And uh, so uh, uh, and at that press conference, and, and they, issued, they, they passed out this thing here at that press conference called uh, the Year of Return, Ghana 2019, a proclamation. This is a proclamation that the, uh, the president of Ghana was there, the Ghana's ambassador to the United States, Ghana's foreign minister, and Ghana's uh, minister of tourism was at this thing at the National Press Club here in D.C. So they're really serious about this. And they said they're going to do everything they can to make it easier in terms of, you know, getting visas and all that kind of stuff for, for people of African descent to come to, uh, to uh, Ghana in, in 2019. When it was my time to, uh, to speak, I was on a panel. Uh, I started off by showing them something. And I'm going to do the same thing here. This is a supplement that was in the 2009 issue of the Washington Post. And I told them about you should understand the Washington Post is one of the three national newspapers in this country, along with the, uh, the Wall Street Journal and the uh, New York Times. And this was a supplement that ran in 2009. And I told them, I said, now you will notice that the headline of this supplement is Africa on the Agenda. 
Africa on the agenda. Not Africa's agenda. Africa on the agenda. And then the subtitle, I'm a journalist. You know, so I'm very uh, strong about words. The subtitle is Africa, the key to global economic growth. Africa, the key to global economic growth. This is something a bit right here. Now, I said to myself, now, if I was in, from coming down here from Mars and somewhere, and I read, saw this thing, I said, damn, those people, the African people must be the richest people and most powerful people on Earth. The key to global economic growth. When I, I read this, and I said, what, to me, what this basically is saying to us as a people, both on the continent and around the world is, you know how, you know, when you're when you out in the kids out in the streets and you say, yeah, I'm going to do so-and-so, so-and-so, and what are you going to do about it? But that's what they're saying with this. Mm -hmm. They're not even trying to hide. Mm -hmm. be they're, they're, they are saying, they're basically saying to us, here's what we see Africa's role is, and what y'all, and, 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 and ain't nothing y'all can do about it. Africa on the agenda. You cannot... There is no better way to understand how they see us. And I also told them that when we talk about, as a member of the Pan-African Feminist Movement, and, and that our position is that there's no option. There's no option. African people on the continent will become continental. Or we, and that's people of African descent around the world, we, not the white man, not the Chinese, we will be condemning our great-grandchildren to be forever at the bottom in the international arena. Mm -hmm. Now, that's just the bottom line. If we go back to my position about this is what happens to a group of people who refuse, these people are letting us know. So we can't say that we don't know. They're saying straight up front, Africa on the agenda. And this is the point I made when I did my presentation at, at, at the... Uh, uh, at the uh, at the at the Congress, because we have to understand this. We can now when we talk among ourselves, we can talk about spiritual and cultural and those kind of things. But when we're dealing with these these leaders, both in this country and on the continent, we got to let we got to say to them and, and to our people in general. I mean, we can't just talk, of, you know, in, in spiritual and we got to say we're talking about something for which there is no option. Africa will either become continental or it will be forever at the bottom of the international arena. And our position with, with the pan african Federalist Movement, we don't say the United States of America. We say the continent of North America. This is a continent. And no country on the African continent can negotiate with a continent. Let me sit down with you and smile at you across the table for a couple of days to make you think you're doing something. But in the end, they're going to tell you, well, here's what's going to go down. Here's what's going down. Now, besides the continent of North America, we deal with the continent of Europe. Now, the Europeans may have, don't have the federal system like they have, in the United, they have here on the continent of North America. But you can bet your life that the attitude towards Africa as a place to be ripped off is universal in Europe. Mm -hmm. The Russians, the Germans, the French, the Belgians, the British, the, 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 the Dutch, the Portuguese, the, all of them regard Africa as a place to be ripped off. So in that sense, we're dealing with the continent of Europe. In Asia, we're dealing with the continent of Asia because though China and Korea and Japan and India may fight back and forth with each other and deal all kind of... When it comes to Africa, they have the same attitude. A place to be ripped off. So basically, the individual African countries are trying to deal with three continents. Three continents. A happening. And this is the position I took when I made my presentation at the... Uh, at the, at, the, at the Congress. And I must say that it was well received. It was well received. People came up to me afterwards and say, you know, when I showed them that thing from the Washington Post, that this is what we got. We're not, we have to make sure that we make it clear 
Folks, we're not talking about no options here. You know, we can do this. We can. No. If we don't do this, and as I repeat, we will be condemning our great-great-grandchildren to be forever in the bottom in the international arena. We will be doing it, not anybody else, because they're letting us know. When people, in black people, now when black people tell me about, you know, Arabs and, and all these social owners stores in the black community, I say you can get every one of them out of here in 30 days. Don't buy from them. Don't buy from them. And they will be gone. They have no alternative market. Mm -hmm. Asians are not going to come from all over D.C. to come shop to an Asian store mm -hmm. in the middle of a black community. They're not doing it. Neither the Koreans, neither the Arabs, anybody else. We've got to start letting our people know that we, we're not providing y'all with no more excuses. We live in an age where, where there's just too much communication and too much information out there. You have to be willfully ignorant. In 2018, willfully, you have decided, I am going to be ignorant. <laughs> There's too much information out there. And we got to start telling our people that we got to tell them some hard truths. And, and not only here, on the continent. I was reading, I got this, one, one of my jobs at the country was to present some of the Pan Africanist positions of Brother Malcolm. Here's an article, an excerpt from an article that Brother Malcolm, following up on what, what Brother Sam said. The brother, I was the editor of the, of the newsletter of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which was Brother Malcolm's organization that he founded after leaving the Nation of Islam. And he founded two organizations, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, for the people who were following him as a Muslim, and OAAU for those of us who were following, following him, you know, from, an, from, you know, from a, uh, uh, another perspective. perspective. <coughs> And I became the editor of the newsletter. Now, up until that time, I had, had not had a single, even remote thought about being a journalist. You know, I was getting ready to go to Howard University and become a political science professor, a teacher, or something like that. But Brother Malcolm, by, when I began to listen to him and learn the importance of, 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 the, of the control and distribution of information, his position that if nobody else will ever get your information out there the way you want it. So you cannot be dependent on that. So we had our little newsletter. And, and, uh, and, and like me, you know, by the time we got ready for our ninth newsletter, I started, now if you can imagine this, I am bugging Brother Malcolm by writing an article specifically for the newsletter. Because we had been running, you know, press releases and all those kind of things. But I said, Brother Malcolm, I want you to write something just for the newsletter. Have me. So that on February the 20th, 1965, the day before he was assassinated, he gave me this, this article for the, for the newsletter. Now, I'm not going to say it's the last article he ever wrote, but all I know is that he gave this article to me on February 20th, 1965. And in it, as the brother, that's why I always refer to him as the master teacher, because the brother had, could really make things clear. And when he talks about Africa, he, he, he says here, uh, let me see, where did he start? He says, He says, white America once popularized the expression, he doesn't have a Chinaman's chance. This means that since China herself was dominated by white outsiders, the Chinese people who were living, at, living abroad had no real power behind them and were therefore disrespected, ridiculed, and abused, wherever they were. But today, that expression is, is outdated, out of use. The Chinese people seem to have more of a chance now than the, than the Europeans and the Americans who formerly ruled, oppressed, exploited, and ridiculed them. China has become independent and has uh, made herself a power to be feared and respected. Although the Chinese are still, although the Chinese are still not loved by the whites who formerly oppressed them, Chinese people are now given respect wherever they are because they now have a strong and independent motherland behind them. And their own individual strength and respect, uh, wherever they may be, comes from that collection, collective strength and respect of their mother country. Black Americans who are now who are tired of being low man on the white man, America's totem pole, can learn a lesson, uh, lesson in this. Our own strength and dignity and respect are 
Uh, wait a minute. It went over to go one page too much. Are inseparable. Are inseparable from that of our mother continent, Africa. As the nations of Africa become independent, and the image of Africa and the African people changes from negative to positive to an image of <laughs> dignity and respect, only then will the image of the Black American, the, the Afro American, uh, also change from negative to positive to an un, to an image of strength, unit, dignity, and respect. So, so as you notice. But America does not talk about Pan-Africanism Pan as some kind of, you know, just as a spiritual and cultural thing. He's being very practical. A strong continent of Africa provides protection for people of African descent wherever they are in the world. If Africa was strong as a continent, there's no way that Cape Verde, Cape Verde could say that you cannot legally change your name to an African name. There's no way they would be able to do that. Now, what do we talk about in terms of, 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 of wealth? In this same little thing, I took this, I put this together to take with me some quotes from different sources from Brother Malcolm and other, and other black Pan-Africanists. I took it with me to, uh, to, uh, to read from while I was over there. And I came across this article from a book called South Africa Inc. It, they, the book was called South Africa Inc. You know, like South Africa was a was a country, I mean not a country, but a corporation. And here's what it said. Uh, another approach is to examine South Africa's mineral reserves on which the economy of, oh, listen to this, on which the economy of almost entirely dependent. The country, including the illegally occupied Namibia, and this book came out in 1986, is the Western world's biggest producer now, folks, listen to this. South Africa alone, according to this book, South Africa, Inc., written by three white writers, says that uh, the country, including illegally occupied Namibia, is the Western world's biggest producer of gold, platinum, uranium, gem diamonds, chrome, Mag magnesium, magnesium ore, and vanadium, which is used to make high-grade steel for the oil pipelines. The value of its minerals is, is exceeded only by the United States. Together, they account for about 60% of all exports, and, and gold alone provides nearly a half of South Africa, America's gold mines, produced 670 tons of gold in 1985, well over half of the Western uh, production. Coal is there. I mean, you see, this, now, this is not even talking about the rest of Africa, what they have in terms of minerals. And brothers and sisters, I guarantee you that even in the days of independence, that I'll guarantee you that, that all that stuff we're talking about, less than 10% of it is in the hand of, of people of African descent. As we speak today. I saw recently that in South Africa, though black people are 85 percent of the population, only six percent of the land is owned by black folks in South Africa to date. Mm. Mm. Wow. See, and this is the, these are the kind of things we got to tell our people. We we cannot just talk in in spiritual terms and cultural terms and you know and but we got to just just some hard. This is all this stuff is on the continent. The Washington Post, Africa is the key to the global economic growth. To global economic growth. And this is what we were talking about at this Congress. How we can get our people to understand <laughs> that you do not have an option. You must unite. You must become continental because you're dealing with three continents that regards you basically as a place to be ripped off. And they encourage, I am convinced that what those former colonialists did, they decided when they, you know, we're not going to fight African independence. Here's what we're going to do. If you get 10 Africans on one acre of land, 
and they call themselves the Republic or whatever. We gonna have they will have an ambassador from Peking and and Washington and 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 Moscow and Paris and just the next day. Because they want all these little tiny countries that have no viability as independent entities. None. So they encourage all. Africa now has more countries than any other continent. Mm -hmm. You know, there are only 12 countries on the continent of South America. But there are 54 in Africa. And, they, and, and I am convinced that this became the policy of the colonialists. You get 10 Africans who get upset and mad about something, they get a little bit of land and say, we are now the Republic of so-and-so. And next day they got ambassadors. Because they want that on the continent. And that's what we talked about. We got to make our people understand that. That this, that this is not, we're not talking about an option the pan african federalist movement is that this is not presented as though it's some kind of option. If Africa will either become continental or it will be forever at the bottom of the arena. I did, you know, I'm a historicity buff. So I, I, this bro, there's a brother there named, named James Jerry Johnson. Uh, mm. uh, mm. Single talked about him a little bit. This brother has got almost a block long, a wall. Got all these great leaders on it, mm. all the way back to Akhenaten. Great leaders from all over the African people of Africa said all over the world. I mean, it is powerful. And I said, Jerry, man, could you get me some copies of some history books that are used in Ghana? I want to see what they're saying, you know, what they're teaching in terms of history. Because, and I did that because when, back in the 1970s, when I first when I went to East Africa, I was at a luncheon. And there was, a, there was an attractive young woman who was a Kikuyu, who was the same uh, ethnic group. You know, I don't say tribe. It's the same term they use for European groups. They call them ethnic groups. They don't say tribes. She was, she was a Kikuyu. And so we were talking, and she kept referring to the Mau Mau's as terrorists. So finally, I, you, know, I, you know, I just couldn't take it no more. So I said, why are you calling them terrorists? I said, you know, we, we call them liberation fighters. And she said, well, that's what she was studying in history, because all the history books came from England in Kenya in 1970. Now, I don't know whether this has changed or not. So I wanted to see some history from Ghana. So he gave me these two books, Africa and Ghanaian history, and history, uh, Akiola series history, and it's... It's for senior high schools. Of course, now they're all in English. That's some, that was one of the things I saw when I was in Ghana. I'm telling y'all, when I was in Ghana, and we, we were riding down, by the way, so let me tell you, they drive crazy over there. You think you've seen some crazy driving over here? You ain't seen no crazy driving till you get on those highways, that into that third way. Man, I'm, I rode out there to this brother's place. As a passenger seat, I came back. I said, I said, I don't want to sit in the passenger seat going back. I'm going to sit in the back. So at least I will see, you know, what's going on. I said, in the back seat, man, I did not want to sit in that passenger seat. Because by the time we got there, I was like, this. it was worse than the airplane flight. But all along the side of the road, all of the all of the signs, the land, what are they call the, what's the big signs on the side of the road? Billboards. billboards. All the billboards. All the stores, signs, even the small little stores, all in English. Yeah. Every single one of them is in English. At the university, where the University of Ghana, where we had our meetings, you know, the building is called the Dean of Missions. The Dean of all of it is in English. And the his, these history books are written in English. But I must say, I've just had a chance to really read them yet. I've kind of glanced through, and they they they, got, they, they seem to be doing some serious stuff. I've been very presently surprised thus far. One thing I have a problem with, that's why they use terms like the new world. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell people, well, how can, what do you mean new world? People have been living over here, what is now North and South America, for centuries right. before the Europeans came. So why is it a new world? Millennia. You know, you could have, yes, if you go going to say that, you should say new world to the Europeans. But they make it sound as though there was nobody here. And the Europeans discovered, you know, discovered this, 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 
you know. So, uh, but uh, but I, I got these two books, and 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 but they I've been kind of glancing through them. I, I, I hope sometime in the next few months to be able to sit down and really go through them to see what they are teaching in terms of history. That was my. Uh, this was this was a a weekly newspaper because they're all in English. This is a weekly newspaper. Uh, this is the daily newspaper, again, all in English. I got six copies of it, called the Graphic, the Daily Graphic. Mm -hmm. This is a this is a daily newspaper that I, you know, I was stealing these newspapers out of the lodge that we were living in. You know, every day I would make get one, uh, and you can see the headlines and everything. But that, uh, and I, I do remember by talking about the traffic. I was reading in one of them that Africa as a continent has a higher percentage of of car deaths by car accident than any other continent. And now, now before, I, before I was riding down that highway in these cars with these folks, these taxis, I would say, see, they just said something that doesn't, but I'm telling you, after seeing that, I can tell the best about me, that may be very true. <laughs> that they have the highest rate of, of car accidents. Death by car accident. After seeing the way, some, I'm, I'm sorry folks, they, they drive, man. I'm just telling you, if you ever get around you drive, you better be real cool. And uh, now this right here is another paper that I got two of these. This is a business and finance newspaper. It comes out weekly. So I picked up a couple of these while I was there. And so this is just some of the stuff that I, that I picked up uh, while, I, while I was there in Ghana. And I, my overall impression of the, of the, of the Congress was that it was really, really, really very, very important and very necessary. And I think we accomplished some serious things because the people who were there were serious. Again, brothers and sisters, I tell this now and again. I, sometimes I get criticized for making a statement like this. Nowadays, I'm interested in quality, not quantity. I'd rather have, rather have 10 serious people than to have 50 people who just jive in. So you can have numbers. So we had some serious. There were some serious brothers and sisters at this uh, pre-Congress in, uh, in 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 Accra. They were serious, and everybody, you know, it, it was not all one big harmonious. There were some arguments and disagreements about this and that and the other. But we put together a manifesto, and we haven't gotten it yet. So I assume maybe be a, I was told maybe another week or so we may get a copy of the manifesto. Uh, that, that 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 came out of the came out of the uh, out of the conference. I had the opportunity. I met the, uh, 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 Dr. Kwame and uh daughter, Samira. and Samira, and I met uh, uh, Juju Nieri, who's one of my favorite leaders of that time. I met his his daughter-in-law. You know, she was there, and uh, but it was all. And, and, and uh, now, I must say, I am not a very adventurous eater. I stick to it with what I can see and know. So when I order food, I order chicken and fish. That's it. I ain't order nothing because I don't want no goat. I don't like lamb, you know, which is which, which, which major dishes there, you know. So I just eat <coughs> chicken and fish. And uh, I had some, you know, some really nice meals and everything. Uh, when I went to, finally got to go to Elmina, it was, it, was, it was as powerful as everybody had told me to go into this castle. And, and, and which is still basically just the way it was when it was built in the 1400s. With, you know, with some of the wear and tear that you get. But I mean, they don't have no lights in there, nothing. You go in there, and it's just the way the brothers and sisters experienced it at that time. And when you go through what they call the door of no return, at that time, the water from the Atlantic Ocean came right up to the castle. So when they opened that door, uh, they, they would put the brothers and sisters in canoes because, you know, the big ships could not come all the way up to the castle. So they would put them in canoes and then canoe them down to the ships. But that door, what they called the door of no return, was like, when you went to that door, that's it. That's it. And, 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 and that was a powerful, you know, to go through there and, and listen to the stories and, and remember what I had been told, you know, from history, it was it was powerful. It, 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 it uh, evoked a kind of a powerful uh, uh, emotions, you know what I mean? And a couple of the people were actually in tears. I mean, they literally in tears. 
because of, of, the, of the type of thing that he wrote. But uh, uh, and a funny, uh, one thing that really kind of really kind of uh, that took me a while to get used to is that the young people, because you know we were on a college campus, so a lot of the volunteers were students, you know, and they would you know they volunteered, they would give us water, get water for us, and little things we needed done. They would do so whenever they would do it, I would always say thank you, and they would say you're welcome, Daddy. <laughs> they called me Dad every single because I my hair I, I got a haircut since I've been back. My hair was longer, and, and I guess you could see the gray very, very much clear. But every time I would say it, those students, they would always say, thank you, Daddy. And they did it in a way that, you know, that was obviously a part of the culture. It was not something they were just doing, I'm sorry, that they were doing, you know, just to show me, you know, for me. It was a part of the way they do it. But that kind of, kind of, that first couple of times, that kind of chilled to me a little bit, you know, just for them to say, you're welcome, Daddy. <laughs> And, uh, and the male and female students, you know, would say that uh, every time. But uh, after the students at the university were, I mean, they were really so anxious to know. And they knew of Brother Malcolm. It's like that I got to say, man. That was one thing I found out. They knew. They did not know, maybe not know a whole lot about it. But they, thank you. But they knew of Brother Malcolm, man. They knew who he was. And, of course, they were just overjoyed to meet someone who had worked with him during the last 15 months of his life. And also to meet one of his daughters, Malak. Malak Shabazz, she was, she went along with me. She told me she was going along to hold my hand. She calls me Uncle Peter. So she went along to hold my hand. We get on the airplane because she knew my, uh, my fear. They had us sitting right across the aisle from each other, you know, on the, uh, on the plane. Uh, but that, that kind of gives you, I guess, I'm trying to give you like a general idea of my, of the whole affair. I would definitely recommend, if you have not visited Ghana, go. And now the, the Ghanaian president said at that press conference, I don't know whether he's accurate, but he said that he said that most of the people who were taken from Ghana into what is now North and South America and, and, and the Caribbean came through uh, came through Ghana. So that Ghana has a strong, you know, has a there's a should be a strong connection between people of African descent. In, in, in North and South America and the Caribbean and Ghana because most, that was the, where most, most of the people came. They were not necessarily Ghanaian, but they came through Ghana to put them on the ships to bring them uh, uh, over to uh, the United States, I mean what is now North and South America. Uh, we stayed at a lodge that was very similar to a uh, you know, like when you go to universities and they have maybe a place on campus or near the campus where parents of students can, when they come to visit, they can stay. It's not fancy, but it was very adequate, very clean. When you wanted hot water, though, you had to, you had to push this button on the wall to, to make the water hot. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that air conditioning. Uh, you, you could not leave the air conditioning on all day. If you left it on, when they cleaned the room, they turned it off. So when you came back into the room, the place was steaming. So you had to turn the air conditioning on to let it, you know, let, get, let it cool out. But they turned it, they didn't let it run all day long, you know, in, the, in this lodge. So, you know, we just stayed away. And I would say, folks, if you're going to take a trip that long, don't go for a week. You've got to have at least three weeks. you got to have at least three weeks. Don't go for a week. We went because we were going to a conference. I just wish, I, wish I'd had the money to stay for another week or so, but uh, but I didn't, so I had to come back, you know, at the, at the assigned time. But it, but it's 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 well worth the trip. It's well worth the trip, and and I'll end by saying that the one thing that fascinated me, and that nobody to this day has been able to tell me how they do it, is to see those brothers and sisters walking through the streets with a basket of bananas on their head. Now, people are giving me all, I keep saying, how do they do that? And I've had a million different explanations, and none of them make sense to me. I don't know how people can have a basket of bananas on their head and walk. And I mean, they're not like tiptoeing. They be walking, you know, just like we walk with, the, with these things on, and they don't be holding it with one hand. So, so Brother Bell. Before, before I announce, because uh, I want to let people know about Good. the leadership, but before that, I want to ask you a quick question because I'd like you to elaborate on 
how did the young people respond to you when they found out your relationship to Malcolm, and how did they respond to Malcolm's daughter? Oh, they, when, they, when uh, I was introduced as, as having been uh, working with Mother Malcolm, to know, and she was like, and, and so of course, they swarmed to me after, after, uh, after I did my presentation, and, 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 the, and the panel was over. Many of them came up to me and wanted to know more about Brother Malcolm and asked me more about him. Because as I said before, they all were aware of who he was. They might not know a whole lot of details, they knew who he was. Right. I did not have to explain who he was. They knew who he was. And I, and I told them, I said in my presentation that, that, that when Brother Malcolm, in, the, in, this, in May of 1964, when Brother Malcolm came to Africa, but he was treated almost like he was the Secretary of State of people of African descent in America to, to, to Africa. He had audiences, folks, not quiet meetings or quick meetings. He had what they called audiences with President Nasser of Egypt, President Nkrumah of Ghana, President Zikwe of Nigeria, President Toure of Guinea, President Kenyatta, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, and Prime Minister Milton Oboto of Uganda. He had audiences with these people when he was in Africa. I mean, when you begin to see how he was treated, you will know why the CIA and the FBI and those folks regarded him as very dangerous. Because, you know, we have to remember now, we're talking about that, that period of time was the height of the so-called Cold War. Right. And this country was involved in a major propaganda right. battle with the Russians. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the Russians was using this, you know, the, the, the racism thing against uh, the United States. So for Brother Malcolm to be over there and being received in audiences with these brothers, not no quick meeting at some and how you doing? I mean, when they, he sat down, he said from one, from an hour and a half to three hours with each one of those, 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 those brothers. That was extremely important, which is now why my, my 19, 2019 project, as I'm going to do a book on what Brother Malcolm was doing internationally. So they will help to explain why. And and his his daughter, of course, you know, she was like like almost like a celebrity. You know, she was like a celebrity. I mean, they they, they want to take pictures with her. You know, everybody over there, believe me, they got cap, you know, his phone just like they got here, man. Everybody got, we got a cell phone. So they all wanted to do pictures and everything. And, and um I think to the point where she was getting a little bit annoyed. <laughs> I had to kind of chill her out a few times. You know, go ahead and take the picture, you know. So, you, so just to, I, I want you to stay on that point because, see, I think this is important. But, you know, uh, we talked earlier about uh, the, the whole Pan-African connection back at that time period. So in terms of Malcolm uh, being represented at the United Nations, how did that happen? Because uh, could you explain to everybody how that Well, his goal... Brother Malcolm's goal during the last year of his life was to take the United States government before the UN Commission on Human Rights and accuse it of being either unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of black people in this country. That was his, that was, that was his international goal. Now, he could not take it there himself. This is important. This is he had to get a member of the United Nations to take it. And that's what he was doing. It's his whole thing he was doing during the last 15 months of life was around getting African countries. Now, you know, he probably could have gotten the Russians or, the, you know, some of those folks who were against the United States from a political perspective to do it. But he didn't want that. He wanted African countries to do it. And I found out years, you know, years later after the assassination, Dr. John Henry Clark told me that he had gotten six African countries that had agreed, and there were several others who were leaning that way. The United States... The United States to this day, mainly because we are here, has not signed the, UN, the United Nations Commission uh, on Human Rights. They have never signed it. To this day, they haven't signed it. Because if they sign that, then we can go to the UN as individuals. Right, right. And they don't want that. So they have never signed it. They're one of the few countries in the world that have never signed the UN Commission on Human Rights. So, and, and, and that's why the OAAU, when we first formed it, Brother Malcolm always insisted that our organization be called a human rights organization, right. not a civil rights organization. Mm -hmm. Because human rights is the international term. Mm -hmm. Civil rights is within the country. 
human rights. So the, OEA, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, we always call ourselves a human rights organization from the very beginning. And he had gotten six African credit cards and Dr. Clark, who had agreed. And you can see that when you see that he, when he traveled in Africa, and I got other newspaper clippings and stuff like that that I got from papers and things in those days, which show he was basically treated almost like a secretary of state, mm -hmm. or a foreign minister of our foreign minister representing us internationally. And 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 Hoover them and the CIA those boys, they, they followed him. They did all kinds of things. To, and when they realized that none of that was working, they they, they sent back that and arranged for the assassination. Mm -hmm. But none of the other things they tried to stop him were working. So then they sit back. And, and, and of course, all of this goes back to it. The, there's a British writer named Anthony Summers. He wrote a book on J. Edgar Hoover called, I think it's J. Edgar Hoover, Official and Company, something like that. I don't know the exact title. But he wrote a book on J. Edgar Hoover in the 1990s. And he, he, he quotes Hoover as saying to then Senator Lyndon Johnson, because this was, because he, the writer in the book says, describes Lyndon Johnson as, as then Senator Lyndon Johnson. And according to this writer, this British writer, Hoover went to a luncheon with, with President, with, with Senator Johnson, and said to him, that they, got, that they were talking about different things, and, and, and said to him, quote, we wouldn't have any problem if we get those two guys fighting, and we could get them to kill one another off, end of quote. Those two guys were Brother Malcolm and Dr. King. Now, Hoover made that back before 1960. And then, of course, in the COINTELPRO thing, which came out in the 19, in the, we finally uh, were able to see what it was like. He said in the second part of it, it says that one of the goals of COINTELPRO was to prevent the rise of, quote, unquote, a black messiah. Right. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X would have been one had he not been killed. And then they listed the people who they thought had the possibilities mm -hmm. of, of, of becoming, right. quote unquote, the Messiah. This COINTELPRO, of course, was a, was a was FBI spy group. Mm -hmm. And they listed Elijah Muhammad, Martin Luther King, and, and, uh, and then Stokely Carmel, mm -hmm. came later Kwame Ture. Mm -hmm. and, and then it said, well, don't worry about uh, Elijah Muhammad because he's too old. And then it listed Dr. King and Stokely. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Dr. King was assassinated. And and uh, and Kwame Ture was basically exiled. That's right. Mm -hmm. This is in COINTELPRO. So I mean, mm -hmm. this all of this stuff, man, is is uh, uh, and this is this is the real real deal. And 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 uh, the uh, and, and so so when you get involved with Pan African Federalism, you have to understand, this is going to be, I mean, this is, these big boys in in in, uh, in these other continents, Asian. I read it just something in, in the New York Times, United Times last Sunday about these Indians from India and South Africa. They became billionaires. That father was like a street cleaner or something in, in, in South Africa. Somehow they ended up becoming billionaires in South Africa, and they now uh, are accused of the current South African president, Zuma, whatever his name was, who was recently out of office. He, he's accused of being in connection with him, corruption with him. But these were in, so this, this is what I meant when I say, though the... Though the Asians, the Indians, the Chinese, the Japanese, Koreans, they fight each other. They talk, but when it comes to Africa, they have a totally continental attitude that Africa is a place to be ripped off and exploited. Right. The same way with the Europeans and the same way with the... With, question with, for you about yes, that. question. Yes. Uh, so before we go to questions, yeah, if you could just briefly, uh, what was the conversation around that? Just like the invasion of the Indians and like the Chinese, what were the young people or just anybody else from the continent? What, what was their what, what, what was their take on that? Well, the Pan African Federalists, who mainly I talked to, mm -hmm. we understood that as a you know, we, to us it was no uh, no. Uh, we talk about you know these units that they're all the now. I don't know. I I know is that when watching Ghanaian television because my room had their television set. So I'm going through it. And by the way, they had these Ghanaian, I guess they were Christians, African Ghanaian Christians, and they were having a, 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 I was watching their show for a while, and they had this huge, everybody, this huge 
big white Jesus on the wall. Mm -hmm. Then I turned to another station, and just as I got to this station, another African religious people, and they they were singing. I don't know why, because I couldn't understand. It was you know they were they were speaking in, in their own language, but they were singing. We shall overcome. But they sing the most soulful version of We Should Love a Club I have ever heard. I mean, they sing it like a gospel song. They sing it like a gospel song. And I mean, and they sing that song. But uh, I, was, I watched at least, I think, five or six stations I went through that had Chinese subtitles. <coughs> this tells you how deeply China. See, we've got to get over this idea. Now, Brother Malcolm, of course, used China as an example back in 1964 when he was talking about how a strong China protects people. But that, does, that, that is no means condones which, because China right now right. Is, is doing the same thing that the, 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 the Europeans did. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing. But we can't just, and I, what I get, I, mean, you do, I don't know if you want to talk about the Chinese. Because all they're doing, is, all of, I talk about the three continents. The continent of Europe, the continent of North America, and the continent of Asia. All see Africa as a place to be exploited. And this article said Africa is the key to global economic growth. Yeah. All right. But, but that's, that's it, because we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna do what we said in terms of dialogue and questions and answers. You can ask any questions, but this is important so y'all need to know and connect it into what you heard Brother Bailey saying, what Brother Sam said, and what I have said about the Pan African Fellows movement. And we have we got a lot more that's gonna come to you. Uh, about what took place. But listen to this, because this is extremely important. The chairwoman y'all heard me say was Sister Kathy, uh, who, who hails from, uh, she's in South Africa, but she hails from Liberia. She's an esquire and lives in South Africa, Azania, and she is the chairwoman of the Pan-African Fellows Movement now, since the conference. Come, come. And also, the, the deputy chair is a brother named Jumi Jumai, Jumei Faye. Now, he's based here. He's from Senegal originally, and he hasn't taken American citizenship. He's still got his Senegalese citizenship, but he lives in Jersey. And he's the brother that was at our conference and represented the IPEC that came out of uh, Senegal. Well, now he has moved up, and now he is the, our co-chair along with Sister Kathy. Uh, He's the one who the, recruited me into the Pan African Federalist movement. In fact, in, and 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 Jumay says that Brother Bailey, they were in Brother Bailey's house with my brother Cliff. Cliff, stand up in the back. And this was years ago when they came up with the concept of the Pan African Federalist movement. And Brother Jumay says that the reason it's not the African Federalist Congress is because Brother Bailey convinced them that it should be Pan African. Y'all hear me? So anyway, that was done. Uh, the general secretary is uh, Aziz Fall from Senegal. Uh, the finance of, of, of secretary is Nana Ama, Ama, Amaka of Ghana. The strategy uh, a, a person is Michelle Dika Kadindra, and I don't know whether this is a sister or a brother because I haven't uh, I haven't placed the pictures yet with the names. But I'm trying Marcel to, is a male name. Male name, but I'm trying to give you an idea of the places they came from and who was uh, elected. Uh, from Central African Republic. Structure is none other than Brother David Horn, the former international organizer of the UNIA, one of the founder members of the Pan-African uh, Pan uh, Pan Diaspora Union, and also one of the founders of... Uh, uh, of uh, SRDC, the Sixth Region Diaspora Caucus, and a brother who's a tenured professor in LA, and his position is, uh, he's in from the United States of America, but his position is dealing with structure of helping to build the local initiating committees globally. Because structure is extremely important, as you heard from Brother Bailey's point, uh, you don't have an option. You hook up with, I mean, and I understand what Brother Bailey is saying. What I was saying was not so much an option with the Pan African <laughs> Fellows Movement, but I was saying if you, if that's a little heavy for you, Brother Bailey don't want you to even try to be a part of it, because he ain't got to, no. I understand Brother Bailey's an elder giant amongst us. Now, my position is yeah. that you cannot organize and persuade and educate at the same time. See? You have to first organize the true believers. Right. Once you get the true believers organized, then you outreach exactly. to those people who you have to persuade and educate. 
But we, we tried that. I came out of the 70s and 80s, and we tried that over and over again. We would have 20 people, five are serious, 15 are kind of swaying back and forth, and we would spend all our time trying to get these 15 instead of taking these five and going on and moving. I, I hope young people don't make that mistake we made. Get the true believers organized. Then once you get the true believers organized, then you outreach. No, so we are blessed, y'all, to have this giant amongst us right now, sharing with us. I'm telling y'all, we're blessed. And so, you know, please hear all and under understand that he's dealing with experience. But anyway, communication. Uh, and by the way, the Pan-African Fellowship Movement sees him and myself as consultants to what happens in D.C. I want y'all to hear what our positions are. We're consultants to it. But we can roll up our sleeves and do whatever. But, of course, Brother Bailey is our elder statesman, and that's how we deal with him, but, you know, because of, of, of his legacy. And uh, communications, Awa Daidua from Senegal. Uh, external affairs, Adama, I can't pronounce the last name, from Mali. Uh, youth, uh, the Kilindi from South Africa. Uh, legal person, Solomon from Ghana. Uh, security is Michael Flores from Belize, Central America. Rick Caribbean, and these are, these are remember I told y'all that we had several regions, right? <laughs> y'all remember that, those that were here earlier. Regions are, <clears throat> uh, uh, regions are larger than LIC. Uh, Rick Caribbean is Sharon Paris Chambers, Jamaica. Rick Latin America is Roy Guevara Aza, Honduras. Uh, I said Rick North America, which is relevant to our continent, is my brother in Walibu, KQ Amaseta, also known as Edward Brown, uh, United States of America, and he's based in Florida. Uh, Rick East Africa is Louis Maganga of Kenya. Uh, Rick West Africa is Bernard Marno of Ghana. I'm sorry, I left one off. I'm gonna back up. Rick Central America is Malika Francos of the Republic of the Congo. Uh, West Africa is Bernard Marna of Ghana. And Rick Europe is Lazar K. Zebra of France and Burkina Faso. So he lives in France, but he's originally from Burkina Faso. <laughs> Rick South Southern Africa is Shakula Karis, and that's Zimbabwe. Now there are others uh, that may be added to this, which make up what is called the International Preparatory Committee. Now they were just elected in December, and the reason they folded the IP I see, which came out of Senegal, is because Senegal's original intent was to build the idea out and to create a global leadership. So we just, this month, got a global leadership of the Pan-African Federalist Movement that will be caucusing, and then locally, you're dealing in this area with my brother here, Sam, who's the leader of the local initiating committee and Brother Peter Bailey and I work with him, right arm and left arm, <coughs> or back and front, however you want to look at it. So I want y'all to be real clear on some of the things, that, especially if you heard his presentation, uh, mesh it with Brother Bailey's and what I said, because all of that is relevant to the Pan-African Fellows Movement. And we're going to go into the question and answer period. One other piece is, uh, you mentioned Malcolm's daughter, and she also works by... Uh, taking people to, through the United Nations, young people. Yeah, yeah. She wor she works at the United Nations mm -hmm. uh, with uh, non-government organizations, especially ones dealing with young people. In fact, she's getting ready to go to some event uh, in January in Costa Rica. Right. And uh, she told me she'll be going back to Ghana in uh, in June. Uh, I don't know if I can get on an airplane again. Mm -hmm. So I may I may be, I may be anything I do know I may be doing by Skype. So. So, I don't know how to do Skype, but somebody will show me how to do it. But, uh, so may, some of you may have seen some of the promo, too. Uh, Dr. Julius Garvey was also invited, the son of Marcus Garvey. But due to some health issues, out, not with him, but with his family, he didn't go. So I just wanted y'all to be clear, because those that might have saw that,
because you saw Malcolm's daughter and Julius Garvey out there. You saw some of the promo out there. But anyway, I just wanted to clarify that he's also in communication with what's going on and supportive of the Pan-African Feminist Movement. So I just want y'all to be clear. You know what I'm saying? All right. So before we, uh, first, let's give Baba Peter a hand. Oh, right? yes. Absolutely. I'm telling y'all, sit at, sit at the elders and giants' feet while y'all can, man. Like, this was, a, you know, it. it's just so good being in close proximity to, you know, people who are there, who have the experience, who have the wisdom. Because when I'm learning, you know, and I'm pretty sure some of us can agree that history repeats itself and that there are always lessons in history. So we got to take what we learned from yesterday and apply it to today. In the spirit of that, I'm going to open the floor for questions. And while we're doing that, I'm kindly asking whoever has that sign in sheet, if you can just hold it up in the air real quick. Just right in front. Right in front. Okay. Would you mind holding it up? And everybody that has not signed it, please sign it. Yeah, so if you just got in, you know, at, at, at any point in the presentation, if you can just sign that list, I'm asking for your name and your phone number. We're making phone calls. We're not doing emails. We're going to make phone calls. If you don't answer the phone, I'm going to leave a voicemail. I'm going to text you. If it's a landline, I'm going to leave a voicemail there, too, and I'll call back maybe an hour, two hours later to really confirm your participation in this. You know, at that point, I'm going to answer the call. If you're not answering the call, cool. If you are, let's come along. All right. What the, explain no to them when we say answer the, the call, not your phone call, but to answer the call, because that's the only requirement. Explain. No problem. Explain no problem. Time. Great point. So as far as answering the call, so this applies to anybody who heard the presentation about Pan-African federalism or who didn't. Answering the call means that you're committed to realizing this Pan-African federalism vision, where we are organizing amongst ourselves in D.C. to coordinate our activities with our brothers and sisters across the continent in the interest of making a federation where we pressure, those of us on the ground level, where we pressure the leadership, right? Especially the, the black African leadership on this side and on that side. We pressure them to relinquish up to 70% of their power and take it and give it back to us. And when they relinquish that power, they make it in the form of a federation we're pretty much, we're all coordinated. So where you have the Europeans, they have their thing, the other people, they have their thing. We're organizing amongst ourselves to create a Pan-African Federation. But that's going to happen from the ground up. Very important. Okay? Not from the top below, but from the ground up like the way it was supposed to be. Understand, this was the original vision of the OAU. Okay? Okay? OAU pretty much, all right? What's called the African Union today. But the African Union and the OAU are two different entities. When we started getting away from the OAU, this is what the call for Pan-African Federalism came into play, okay? So when we're talking about answering the call, we're talking about you, who I'm asking to join the call, to come on board and help us build something where we can pressure Elected officials here, okay, and elected officials on the African continent and other places around the world to relinquish their power and help us create a federation where we're politically organized, mm -hmm. politically organized against other forces out there that want to exploit us for our material resources and our ingenuity. Because understand that there's a brain drain going on right now. That's right. Our best and our brightest from the African continent are over here for whatever reason. Okay, and they're sending money back, but as far as the intellectual property and whatever else, it's not totally there yet. So all of this goes into play. So please understand, when I'm calling you on the phone and I ask you if you want to answer the call, that's what I'm asking. And one more point that I want to make. We're not asking you to do anything extra. Not at all. This is not another organization. You don't have to, you know you know, uh, um, carve out more time or do other tasks. I understand we're all busy. But the point is for us to organize. You keep doing what you're doing, but you do it in accordance with what other people in your sector are doing. You bring on other people from your sector, and we're organizing for self-determination, <laughs> for our own identity, for our political sovereignty. That's the goal. 
You keep doing what you're doing, but it's in the interest of Pan-African federalism and us building sovereignty amongst ourselves locally, regionally, and internationally. And that's why I stopped, y'all. So I would just like to add that one of the things that I am who strongly believe and that I'm going to push, I didn't bring it up in, in Ghana, is that the African countries who provide scholarships to students to, to go anywhere, whether it's China, the United States, wherever, They've got to start insisting. You got to come back for at least five years. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you go to West Point or the Naval Academy or uh, the, uh, the Air Force Academy, you get four years of free education. You got to get five years. You can't you can't come out of West Point and then go, go join some corporation. You got to get. And I think that that Africans who come here on up from from the continent on scholarships provided by the government. Should be made very clear. Mm -hmm. When you finish whatever school you're doing, you gotta come back for at least five years and mm -hmm. to the to the country. I know that the people don't like that, but that that's one of the positions. I'm that's one of the things that I'm gonna be pushing a position for the Pan African Federalist movement to uh, to to take. So 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 come on. Once Let's have the questions now. We, we, no, we one, could, this is important though yeah. because we don't want different organizations. We want you to be very clear. If you're in an organization and y'all got issues, we don't need that. Y'all deal with that in your organization. No, this is important. It's very, very important. Also, we're not trying to debate around ideologies. We're dealing with practical application, basic stuff. So if you got differences, fine. But disagree, don't be disagreeable. Because we, we spend too much time sometimes in, in formations battling over differences and not understanding that we still have the same objectives. You understand what I'm saying? You heard what Brother Bailey was saying about Dr. King and Malcolm. I've talked to brothers and sisters say, wow, wow, I'm about Malcolm, I'm not about King. Well, they ancestors now, they are about us. They both had an objective, they went about it in a different way. So that's not what we got time to deal with now. So I'm not saying that you don't do that with your groups or your, your particular family or whatever. But we don't need that because that will bog us down. Now, we're going to have differences, as Brother Bailey said, that, that we had. In yeah. But you work through them. I was taught to try to hammer it out on the ample of reason. So whether or not you had a group and a split from a group or blah, 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 we ain't got time to deal with that. But we welcome everybody in the Pan-African Fellas Movement. I want y'all to be really clear. Whether or not you're the PGRNA, whether or not you're the UNIA, the AAPRP, or whoever you are. If you're African, you're welcome in the Pan-African Fellas Movement. But don't bring your issues organizationally to us, because we're going to have enough to deal with with what we're up against, against the war that we're in. Brother, come on. Go ahead. You can open up. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I have a, a question and a comment. The comment is uh, I feel compelled to, to share this story with everyone. Sure. Uh, I had an uh, opportunity to um, meet another giant. And it was on uh, Dorothy Irene Height. Mm -hmm. And when I met uh, Queen Mother, uh, and a lot of folks who don't know, mm -hmm. she is the sole reason mm -hmm. that MOK actually even spoke at the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that. Like, she made that happen. And he only spoke for like, what, mm -hmm. what, what less than 10 minutes? Like, like this is our kind of speech that everybody thinking like everybody came to see him or something. Oh, you said, who you talking about? Uh, yeah, I had, dream, I had a dream. Well, I was there. Yeah. I was you was there? there? Yeah, I was there, yeah. brother. So, Dorothy was... Irene Height made that happen for him because yeah, yeah, yeah. they had to argue about it. So anyway, I just want to put it out there. But I met her and I asked her, I said, what would you say to a young man that would give his life to, to continue the, the uh, unfinished work of Malcolm and Martin? And she's in a wheelchair, she's holding my hand, and she's like taking a, a moment to reflect. Like she's really taking it serious, like what I asked her. And then she says to me, she says, your enemies are not even thinking about you. Right? And at first I was insulted because I thought she was like saying like, please, like, you know, who are you? you know, there. But she was like saying, your enemies not even thinking about you. And then she leans in and she says, they think they already won. So they won't see you coming. Mm. And that's our edge. If we ever did anything, they wouldn't be so shocked. Like, these niggas did something? Because mm. they think they got it. Rap, lock, whatever, and y'all ain't, ain't going to do nothing about it. 
you know what I'm saying? I just want to put that over there so that, you know, take some of this, this edge out of the room. Like, they are actually expect you not to do something. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's why they're out there. That's why they would, that's why they, <laughs> Good they would do it alone. That's why they were doing the appetizing supplement like the one that I showed you. <laughs> I mean, they basically, if they thought that we were in any kind of position, or they had any kind of fear that we would, you know, could react, they would, they would that put that out there that openly. Mm-hmm. Africa on the agenda. I mean, right. I mean, it, that's it. Mm-hmm. Africa on the agenda. You said you had a question. On the, on the plate. <laughs> you said you had a question too. Come on. Uh, and my question is, I want to make sure I got this quote from uh, Barbara Bailey correct. Yeah, you said, uh, I just need you to reiterate, this is what happens when the people refuse to organize the national movement to protect their interests. Um, I don't think I got it uh, no. verbatim. What I was responding to nowadays, all these incidents are happening now, the reemergence of overt oh, white so supremacy. Okay. Uh, the, the reemergence of overt white supremacy in this country. Where things they used to for for a few years they try to do it undercover and hide it, but now they're back, they're more and more doing those kind of things openly. And when I hear black people say, "Well, you see what they said? This 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 girl, this black student over at Georgetown University, uh, they put a banana on her door, uh, so and so happened." So and and when people say that, I say to them, "This is what happens to a group of people who resolutely refuse to organize a national movement." to promote and protect their interests. Mm-hmm. This is what happens to you. And when people say, to me, well, you know, black people ain't going to do that, then I say, then pay the consequences. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Mm-hmm. We got to stop providing our people with, we know what the white supremacists do, what they plan to do. That whole, we know it. We, we know it. The question is, what are we going to do about it? It, 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 you know, and and, uh, and and if you don't do something, there are certain things that happen to you. They put bananas in front of your door. Police feel no fear to shoot, you, you know, uh, young black males. They don't fear because they know there's no kind of national movement that would be, that would that would be deal with it. So that's this is what happens to a group of people who resolutely refuse to organize a national movement to promote and protect their interests. And on the continent, we hear about the exploitation that goes on from China and the United States and England and France and all those places. This is what happened to a divided continent. This is what happens. So, uh, my brother? Um, yes, I have two questions. Uh, brother Bailey, the um, yeah, human rights was the uh, motivating uh, factor for uh, Malcolm's uh, involvement in the international realm. Uh, what has become of that legacy, and where are we now <coughs> with regards to that particular matter of uh, addressing human rights uh, on an international plane? And my other question is to you, Senghor, and that's you spoke about the requirement, I think, or maybe you could clarify, that involvement in the uh, Federation Mm -hmm. would be on the basis of being a civil society. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Maybe I didn't understand. Could you... Yeah, I will. Let Brother Bailey address the yeah. one that you addressed. Well, uh, the concept still has not gotten as far as I think it should. You, I do find that uh, you find more more people talking about human rights, you know, involved in, in, in around our position in this in the continent of North America than they used to. But we still, you still hear most of us still use the term civil rights and mm-hmm. civil rights and civil rights and 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 civil rights is a, is something that. That is, that is within that in the entity, within that under the auspices. When you say human rights, that's why it's the International Commission on Human Rights, not civil rights. Mm-hmm. So human rights is the international term. And when you want to go international uh, with your grievances against a government, you have to use the term human rights. Mm-hmm. And, and you see a little bit more and more using my, my people of Africa descent in this country, but still not nearly enough. Most of us still talk about civil rights. Right. 
So, you know, so yeah, but to, for clarity. No, what I was saying, because I, I kind of ran both of those in, in between. What I was saying was the Pan-African Fellows Movement only really wants you to answer the call of recognizing what our ancestors did. That's it. As far as the African Union, their requirements is that when you do town hall meetings, you should have civil, a, a civic associations opposed to organizations to be a part of the sixth region. Mm -hmm. So that's not the Pan African Fellows Movement. That's what the uh, or, uh, that's what the uh, OA that's what the African Union has said that for the sixth region they don't want a list of all black organizations. They want you to hold town hall meetings with every the average day citizens and them decide who's going to be their leadership to represent that area of the sixth region. Is that not right, Brother Cliff? So I, I'm clarifying. So that's not that's not a requirement with the Pan-African Federalist Movement. That's that. And what I was saying was in the town hall meetings, that people who come to those town hall meetings that wish to be a part of that, we have that with the sixth region diaspora caucus as well, who's also working with us. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to, you know, okay. I, so, so I just wanted to clarify that. And, and, and it, it is really important to, uh, uh, be clear. So any questions that out there, you ask them because the only recall we asking with the Pan-African Fellows Movement is for you to answer the call. The call came from Kwame Nkrumah and primarily Sheikh Abdel Diop who documented, clearly stated that we should be Fellows. Now there's some debate around Kwame Nkrumah and I want to clarify that in case people are clear. Kwame Nkrumah, when he first started, was clearly Federalist. But later on, he deal a little more with unionism. Now that's a whole nother ball game, but what we're concerned about is the progressive movement of our ancestors. Because now the ancestors in the African tradition, many of our ancestors, of course Marcus Garvey, there's no question about what he was talking about, about Africa, and, and, and on and on and on. So, those ancestors, I, I see back there, I, those ancestors are the call. If you agree to that, that's answering the call. Is that not correct? Yeah. Am, I, am I not correct, Brother Bill? Yeah. That's it. Now, of course, we're still putting structure together, and so each uh, local initiating <laughs> committee will have major objectives, and that's what he was talking about. We will have need for to build uh, economically. We will have a need to build, to protect our community, where you have a group, uh, the, 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 the local initiating committee may say, uh, well, we want to educate the young people in Ward 8, uh, how they can protect their rights in Ward 8. And I'll, and I'll say this real quickly, most people may not know this, I know Sam does, that now human rights in Washington, D.C. is supposed to be taught in the public schools. So that is a gateway for us. Now, don't get me wrong. Now, I don't. I'm not advocating what perspective some other folk may be coming from, but certainly our human rights have been violated, and we know District of Columbia is a colony. But the reality is, our human rights have been violated, and we go back to Brother Malcolm. So that's a gateway for us to talk about how our human rights are violated every day. Come on, you heard that. We at radio, so I, all right. We, Go ahead, brother. No, brother Duno, brother Duno, was, brother Duno was next. I am not an African because I was born in Africa. I am an African because Africa was born in me. Many of us want to give that to Nkrumah. And if we look at our history, scientifically, even before Edward Wilmot Blyden, even before Maria Stewart. But I'd just like to say this, since we were mentioned about human rights. My brothering and my sistering, it is remiss of us not to deal with the League of Nations in reference to human rights and whatever other federated things that happened before 1922. It was a sister, if she walked in this door, she would look like a white woman. Lady Henrietta Benton Davis, who led the delegation in Geneva, Switzerland. It is time for us spent our people.
to talk only about what some men have done. I'm thanking you, uh, Kimon, when you was mentioning about Dr. Heidi. Mm -hmm. Those young people who want to look at her book, her, she has a book that's called Living with a Purpose. If you're in the third grade, or if you're a third grade reader, it came out in 2010. Some of us need to stop just dropping people's names, unintentionally or otherwise. Dorothy Heights has a book that's called Living with of a purpose. What is the role of women builders? Mm -hmm. Not just. Uh, oh, go, do no, oh, do no. You missed my presentation. It's okay. No, 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 no it's not okay because. Please, let him, let him, let him, no, I just want to say it's this. Okay. Though, you didn't miss my presentation because okay. I highlighted that. It, it's clearly. It, it's okay. They heard it. All right. Okay. Okay. And I had to do something else. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, but I didn't say that you all didn't cover that. Okay, that's you said why you I was be missed. Well, we well, singing well, the one thing that you need to learn how to do sometimes, just like when you're on the mic and people listen to you, as the elder brother was saying. But let me take my seat. Those who want to read about Dr. Height can look in a book that's called "Living with a Purpose," and as I. <laughs> As I, as, as, as I stated, there's an article, if some of you, you know, I see all these people in here, I don't see too many people taking notes. You do what you want to do. But this is a forum, right? Yes, sir. Okay? Some of us, we learn when we come to a forum, we take notes. Yes, sir. I can sit here and ask Professor Bailey about when he said too much information is out there for us to be other than informed. Is that a decent paragraph? Yes. Paraphrase. Yes. And just, and, and I'll take my seat, but what happens is that just <coughs> as we, was, we were taught out of supporting each other, we have to be taught into supporting each other. When are we going to set up our Tuesday night school and our Thursday night school and our Saturday night school? It doesn't mean that it's not set up, but what it does mean, it needs more fortification. The enemy, as you stated, uh, Professor Bailey, in that article, if I'm not mistaken, in 2009 in the Washington Post, the enemy thinks that way because the enemy knows from sampling that, is, that, that we are serious, but we are not trained in our seriousness. Those women, it's like when you see me with this button on right here, Dr. Uh, Nanny Helen Burroughs, it's not a come to a forum thing. When are we going to set up our classes for each other even more than what we already have? And those women in the 1922 uh, situation with the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community Leagues, and I'm not talking about the cult of an individual or the cult of an individual organization. It was a continuation. How do we put together panel a high point of those specific things that dealt with, because a lot of times when I'm hearing stuff, we spend like as though human rights was during the 1960s. And it doesn't mean that the people on the panel don't know that, but some of us don't know that. So repetition for some of us is appropriate because Malcolm was born into the African international, as most people know. But we have, to, we have to look at the details. Because the enemy, as Woodson would say, the traducers of the race, <laughs> they deal with details. And we just want to mobilize people. Mobilization gets you nowhere unless it's the objective to organize as what's happening here. Thank you for your opportunity, but I hope get these young people to read about Dr. Dorothy Height and her book, Living With Purpose, right here in this city. We need to study. And I am not an African as what was given to Kwame Nkrumah and many others because I was born in Africa. I am an African and you are too, if that's what you want to be, because Africa was born in you. Uh, Bob, quick question.
Yeah, you don't got to take the somebody out. I just had a quick question. Um, when traveling to Africa, you're saying everyone should make that trip for about three weeks. Like, how much money should we have to make a trip like, like that? Okay, what, what I was saying was that if you're going to go, then it, it, it's best to have at least three weeks. You know, because there's just so much, especially if you're going for the, for the first time. This was my first trip to West Africa, and I truly regret that I did not have, I was there for the conference, uh, for the Congress, rather, and I was there for eight days, and then I had to come back, you know, because uh, I had not made any kind of arrangements to stay, you know, for another week or so. It's a long trip to go. We're talking over about 5,500 miles, at least maybe more, uh, from, 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 the, from Dallas to uh, Accra. But I would say that, uh, of course, like anything else, the earlier you decide and the earlier you get your plane ticket, the cheaper. Because we find out that they the price literally goes up almost daily. Mm -hmm. It goes up almost daily. So uh, we started off we, we started off trying to get a group so you can get a group rate, you know. And by putting it off, when we started off, the, the ticket was $1,050. Wow. By the time we went, when we realized that we were not going to get sufficient people to make a group, we ended up paying over fourteen hundred dollars. Whereas we had started off right away, we got a ticket for you know uh, one thousand fifty dollars. But I would say that you know, plane ticket, hotel, you're probably going to need anything about twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars. I mean, and, and, I mean, it cost me not. You know, I, I never splurge. You know, I'm not one of these people who go somewhere and be splurging, man. I'd be like, you know, and and in Africa. Everything they still bargaining, man. You got to, everything is bargaining. You know, you, people tell you how some costs. You don't just say okay. You got to, well. No, wait a minute. You go back and forth, back and forth. And uh, I got this incredibly beautiful uh, cover for. You can either hang it on the wall, or you can or you can uh, put it on a. You know, it's larger than a spread for a king size bed. That's how big it is, and it's all in colors. The African colors with 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 a. Uh, with sayings in it in both Africans and English, it is it's beautiful, man. Uh, so you know that's the kind of thing. But I would say, you know, you got to save up. And, but 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 again, the the Ghanaians are now trying to make it much easier to come in 2019. Now I don't know what that's going to entail, but that may entail making deals with the airlines, making deals with the hotels, and all that kind of thing. But they're on a major. A major. Uh, I went to that press conference that that they had, and this is the. Uh, I'll show you very quickly. Yeah, this is the this is the uh, the thing that they gave all of us at that press conference. Uh, the year they're calling it the year of return. The year of return, and it has all kind of information on different things that they're going to be trying to do to make it easier for. For, for black people in this country to come to Ghana in the year 2019. So, so I would be checking with that, with the, with the Ghanaian embassy, you know, and that kind of thing. Well, let me, let me add to you, brother, just to give you some estimations. If you start early enough, you can get, you can get a ticket round trip anywhere between $800 and $1,400 if you start early. That's, that's yeah. airfare only. Yeah. Now, if you're going to stay for three weeks, you got to think about almost doubling that for your lodging if you're going to stay in a four or three, four, five star hotel. You can beat that if you communicate with other people in Ghana and you stay with someone or you stay with one of the smaller two star or, or one of the, I wouldn't call them hotels, I would call them, uh, uh, no, like One Africa, for an example. They have huts and they don't have hot water, but it's awesome. And the sister was an expatriate, and you could cut that cost. So I would say just just ballpark figure. If you're going to stay three weeks, about four grand. If you're going to stay less than that, uh, like a week or so, uh, like for example, I stayed six days when I went in uh, in uh, January uh, 2017, and I did mine for thousand six hundred dollars. <coughs> stay plus airfare. But it, de it depends. You got to work through that, you know, and it depends on your living, how you want to live. 
you know, that's that's important. And brother, brother Jerry Jerry Johnson, yeah. who puts up that what I told you the wall of of heroes, he 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 can accommodate about six people at his place uh, at a very good price. Uh, so you know. Well, I just wanted to share, my name is Jessica P. I recently came from Busy Bee's um, Kwanzaa celebration. Mm -hmm. And there, um, at her Kwanzaa celebration, they had different vendors and different people that was talking about the whole return to Ghana um, trip and tour bus that, that they're putting together. And as the vendors and leaders there, they're putting together one for 2019. And the estimated cost for like I think two to three weeks was like three thousand, like um, three thousand. I mean three thousand five hundred for like two to three weeks. But it covered um, your 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 full round trip going and coming. It covered you know the hotel uh, stay for that time. For it covered a lot of different expenses and costs. And I think the main cost that they said you had to cover you know you know out of pocket for yourself was like food and if you wanted to purchase different items there. But um, I have the flyer that breaks down all the details. I could send it to one of the organizers up front and they can, the, the list that everybody put their names and texts on, they can try to, you know, get that information back out to everybody. But yeah, I don't have it with me right now. But I have the flyer that breaks down that, you know, to anybody interested in doing that Ghana return um, to home trip. And there's a list of seven, uh, several different things they're doing. They're also going to where uh, W.E.B. Du Bois um, the Warrior Summit. was. Yeah. yeah that, it, it's, it's a list of different activities that they're doing that's, you know, incorporated in the cost. You don't have to pay out of pocket for all the activities they're doing, too. They're, they announced at that press conference that they're planning events throughout the entire year of 2019, specifically designed to attract black people in this country to come to Ghana. When they had that press conference back in uh, in uh, in November, so they got a, they got activities planned. Uh, I would say you know you might contact the Ghanaian embassy, you know uh, here in here in D.C. to get more information about it. But they 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 seen from I mean at this event, like I said, they had the president of Ghana at this press conference, Ghana's ambassador to the United States, Ghana's foreign minister, and his minister of tourism. So I mean they tried to make it into a a a, a big to do. Right. They even gave us a chocolate, a piece of, of exclusive uh, Ghana chocolate. And by the way, folks, let me tell you, I ate some pineapple in Ghana. I don't never want to eat no more of the pineapple out of these cans that we get over here. I ain't never tasted any pineapple that tastes so good in my life as those pineapples, man, that I ate when, I, when I was in Ghana. And watermelon, watermelon, man, the watermelon was delicious because you're eating stuff that has none of that Stuff they put in stuff here, like to make it seedless. Yeah. All the watermelons yeah. had seeds in them, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so, you know, uh, but like I say, uh, don't ask me too much about food because I am not, a, you know, I don't want no, no. Uh, I'm just eat chicken and fish. So I didn't, I didn't. I'm not a very adventurous. I will say this, brother. I don't know what this brother is lying to us or not, but I gotta tell you this. This brother from, this brother from Belize. Sorry. Named Mike Flory. Mike was a character man, and he he likes to go. He said he goes wherever he goes in Africa, or anywhere else. He always wants to eat what is considered the primary local dish. He wants to eat whatever is considered like the primary local dish. He wants to you know to eat it while he's there. So he was sitting at the table with me and 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 uh, and, and two sisters from Georgia. The three of us, four of us, sitting at the table together. And, and uh, he said something to the young lady who was taking the orders. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and she leaned, you know, he asked about the, the primary, you know, the most popular local dish. So she whispered it to him. You know, she whispered it to him. So, you know, we didn't, you know, we sat there and he told me later <laughs> that the primary local dish was cat. <laughs> And if I had known that that joke was sitting at that table eating cat, I would have got up. You know what I mean? But I didn't know, you know, so I just said that. I don't know what he was, but he was, he swear that that's what he told her, that, that she told him. And she said she didn't say it out loud because she knew that, you know, how we might, how we might react to that. So that's why she whispered it to him. Now, she did do that. She, when he asked the greatest, the most 
most popular local dish. She whispered it to him. She didn't say it out loud. Well, and that's she came back with this dish, dish and gave it to him. East. And he said that. <laughs> the Chinese <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> He said that it was mm. that it was that, she, that it that she told him that the most the most popular local dish was the cat. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you know there's no way you no know the bad. Go to good old road cat. I can eat out no cat. Get yourself some cat <laughs> with mumbo juice too. Mumbo sauce. Oh yeah, yeah. Family, family. Give yourselves a hand, y'all, for real, man. Give yourselves a hand. Thank y'all for the, thank y'all for engaging us. Thank y'all for taking the time to listen. Thank y'all for writing your phone numbers down, and thank you for the insightful questions. Um, there's more information coming out about these meetings that we're going to have. When we give you a call, please answer the call, y'all. We're trying to set an agenda here for 2019. We really want to get some key organizing done, and we want to be very intentional about what we're doing here as far as the Pan African Federalist Movement is going. Um, if you want to catch the live stream of what just happened here tonight, you can go on Facebook. I got my Facebook page. It's Sam P.K. Collins. So that's Sam, S-A-M, initials P.K., and last name Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. A special shout- Is it P period, K period, or P.K. period? P period, K period, yeah. But usually when you, when you type it up without the periods, it shows up, which is why, yeah. So P period, K period. Definitely. It's like a journalist. That's a journalist right here. All right. All right. Um, but yeah, we're good to go, y'all. Special shout out to Kimon uh, for, yeah. for allowing us to use the space, y'all. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah. No problem. Um, before we before we leave out, I'm going to pass around. I thought we had a pan here or some kind of a bowl or something like that. Financial contribution we can leave we at just for you know their graciousness here uh, tonight. We need a bowl yeah, um, because we act did not charge us for this, but we understand we act has bills, light bills, and all like that. So your, your in kind contribution will be very, very much appreciated. And I'm sure, brother, come on. Would you, you want to come up and say anything, to everybody, about right. we act yes. while we well, close it? Whoop over here. So oh, thank you for oh. saying to me. Yay, yeah. yay. Yeah. 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 In your house? <laughs> In your house? He teaches <laughs> chess professionally. Oh, oh, oh. And oh, I've, been oh, 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 oh. I've been playing with children too much. I've been playing with children too much. No, but you want to say anything about what we act when we go I go. I go. We in we act house. Y'all listen up. Thank all of y'all for coming. Thank you all of y'all for um, embracing the my favorite principle of the Kwanzaa, the Coochie Chocolate. Thank you. Uh, Coochie Chocolate. And it is really about doing for self. And I think that everyone has pretty much proven how much you can do on your own. But have you actually done anything with others? You know, the proverb I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of is you want to go fast, go, <laughs> go, alone. go alone. You want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together. And obviously, if we are going to get any further, we're going to have to go together. And if anything, I want everyone to realize that this space right here is uh, the manifestation of Kuchi Chocolate. You know, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't wait for permission. You know, we elbowed our way into it. You know, we are the X factor. And I, and I, I go back to Dr. Um, uh, I call her Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, Mother Queen sister. Because um, she's, she, you, you got to understand that we, we are the X factor. Uh, are we going to continue doing what we've already done, expecting different outcomes? Are we going to do like um, Baba Belly says, and when people say, oh, they did this. Oh, did you hear that they did that? Oh, they cut the boys' dreads and the dreads. I, I'm like, what? You know, the police done shot another boy. They done sprinkled some crack on them. You know what I mean? Like, it's all the same. What are we going to do differently? What are we going to do differently? And I, I, I just like to say this. Um, don't be telling everybody publicly, but I'm saying this to you um, publicly, is that I have not filed income taxes since October the 16th 1995. Okay, I'm just saying that's what I've done. Okay, I think I think we give the government too much credit. 
I think fear is more powerful than their actual weapons. You just scared. <laughs>